Hello there to everyone in the chat. Just give me another minute while I sort something behind the scenes here to get my YouTube connection to Discord so it shows I'm streaming. Bear with me a moment. I'll be back. I'm going out of sync. This is my out of sync screen. Hold on. I'll be with you. That's sorted, don't worry guys. You sound so quiet. Do I really? It's because the music's still loud, okay? It's because the music was still at full volume. Well, not full volume, but you know what I mean. All right, hello. Welcome to my YouTube stream audience who gets to see me every so often. Unlike the Twitch folks that get to see me a few times a week, I'm on YouTube because this is a discussion sort of stream, and that's what I do on YouTube, streaming-wise, where I, I play games on Twitch. And also because this stream is going to be directly from the Bavaria series, like really close to the Bavaria series, so it makes a lot of sense to put it on the same platform. Anyway, welcome everyone. I've got a very unique, interesting stream for you today, and it's going to be dedicated to just war analysis. I've never really done that before. I haven't done a dedicated stream for this before, but we actually did a spot of it back in the comfy Christmas stream that not that many people turn out to because it was locked behind a Christmas stream. And it wasn't advertised as such, you know. Um, if I had started that stream going, oh my god, we're going to do Bavaria series war analysis using the enemy side's point of view of footage, actually, which we're not going to be doing this time. I'm just going to be using my own point of view as well as looking in the saves, because it doesn't. I don't think seeing the enemy's point of view really changes much, because we get to see everything they do anyway, more or less. I mean, when it came to the war in part 14 and 15 that we saw the alternate view of in that stream, it was interesting to see that the entire enemy alliance's army positioning in the beginning of the war, but other than that, it was, you know, the same. All right. Hello, everyone. The intro on the screen says about all of it, and, you know, we're going to be doing war analysis from parts 17 and 18. Parts 17 and 18. So if you have not seen those parts, first of all, what are you even doing if you haven't seen those parts? Second of all, you know, go and watch them if you haven't, or watch the whole series if you haven't watched the whole series. This is going to be heavily spoiler heavy for those two episodes. Starting with part 17, you know, but halfway through moving on to part, the events of part thingy, part 18. Because the war was split into two videos, two halves. It's a game of two halves, much like football. Alright. Um, so here's how it's going to go with the chat though. It's going to be difficult for me to read the chat during this because YouTube chat glitches out a lot for me and I don't have the plugin that fixes it on my new PC. You know, it's complicated stuff. Streaming isn't as easy as it looks, you know. There's so much shit you have to set up in the background. But Lord Lambert's here in the chat, he'll tell you as well. Surely. I mean, the amount of stuff you have to do to your Discord, your streaming software, your audio levels, all of it. Oh my god. You know, the the sort of things that entire teams of people should be doing, just set up by one lone guy here. Come on. I should have a, a dedicated audio guy, you know, a sound mixing desk at the back of my room, like a fucking music gig. I should have a team, I should have an assistant, although I normally do have Pie Chucker. Uh, you know. How long ago were the sessions, by the way? Well, let's start off by answering that question. I mean, this was revealed. It's been revealed in certain, in certain cryptic ways, you know, throughout the series, how long ago it was, right? Uh, it was shown in a Discord message in part 18. So, I mean, it happened around April, May, March 2022, coming up to two years ago, although the series started in June 2023. That was only a year and a half 
or a year and a few months after it. So it was a long time ago. We all know that. Why do I make a series out of something such a long time ago? Because my series is take long ages to do. Um, I was making the I was actively making the Venice series when we played this series, so we actually reference the Venice series quite a lot. In fact, there's going to be a Venice series. There's actually going to be multiple Venice series references in the next episode, part 19. Spoilers. That's not a spoiler for part 19. But um, again, something else to say before we get into it. Um, part 17 and 18 were massive videos, right? 52, 54, 54 minutes. They were huge. They took a lot of work. Uh, part 19, I've been editing it, editing it today, it's coming, but, you know, I'm, I'm not going as fast, okay, I'm sorry, but it's being a bit more relaxed about it. It will come out probably two weeks after the last episode, so a week on Friday, or Saturday, still, so don't worry about that, but then, you know, and uh, so yeah, part 19's coming. It's been, it's been more of a relaxing one to edit as well, because you know how the series often goes, right? You have a big war, and then the next episode is more relaxing, because of, as we build up into the next situation, the next war. Alright. I record in a converted 1.5 meter times 1.5 meter closet. I don't do the whole professional thing. No, that's not what I mean. I don't mean having a whole studio or something like that. I just mean the setups you have to do, your audio the streaming software on the computer and announcing it anyway let's get the proper background music on this background music will see us through the whole thing oh the amount of viewers i get for doing a bavaria series related stream i need to do this for every episode in fact i need to do two streams per episode at least in fact, I, need, I just need to host a Bavaria series talk show in between every episode. Remember, there was this thing with the fucking The Walking Dead called The Talking Dead, right? I, I watched it maybe a couple of times around back when that program was good. That's what I, I need to do, Talking Bavaria. Get a couple of the players from the series on, get Chrono in here to do his Joker laugh live for the audience, you know. Get Weevil in. And I, I could even do that if anyone wants to on this stream, if Weevil... Or anyone, Dempsey, they, they can come in at some point if they want to, but um, uh, can someone time out Shungite Rocks in the chat anyway, please? Cheers. If we do have any moderators, just move all the war analysis segments to streams. I don't think I necessarily want to do that, I don't think I would go that far because at the end of the day, as many as, as many people are, are watching this, it's not going to be everyone. And, uh, I don't know, I think the stream format just works whenever there's a big war like this where a lot more detail could be gone into. I think most of the war analysis I do covers it fine. Five, ten minutes in the video. Anyway, the stream is no longer starting. It has started. The intro stuff is off. We probably don't even have any moderators, do we? Right, I'll deal with it. Uh... Bye. War analysis segments are very fun and good. Yeah. Yeah, this was a huge war. Damn right. The, the war was huge. So this was across parts 17 and 18. I'm not going to talk about the diplomacy or anything. This is going to be pure war and micro and game analysis. I mean, maybe there are a couple of diplomatic points to talk about or the plot. But really, this is just going to be focusing on the war. And... You know, we'll talk about any related things. We can talk about multiplayer, micro, Vic2 advice in general, micro and war. And also, my other source of information, let me just show you, show you that as well. I have the Bavaria series loaded up in Victoria 2 to go along as well. Careful though, Spud. While you're analysing the war, the Ottomans are likely to deck on you again. They might deck on me now, in this. So what I'm going to do here, this is actually the best way to look at it um, right now and the starting part of the war. Interesting, Lambert. I, I, I wonder, should I talk and read messages in the chat or should I really just focus in and narrow down on this because, you know, some fascinating messages like from Lord Lambert there, but I kind of want to get stay on topic. But so... I, for the record, the dual monarchy AI, AI demobilized here. 
and every AI is starting to make movements that the player was not making. But otherwise, this is a Bavaria series setup. Now, obviously the best I mean the best place to start as we get in here is the initial positions of the armies, right? So you could see my point of view in the video, easily enough. But now we get the the Albion army and where is the Polish army? Where's the PLC army? It's all lined up against Russia. And there are those Chinese troops that were spotted in the video as well. Why does Aragon still exist? It's, it's just an AI that the players are mopping up slowly. Spain's actually getting Catalonia at the start of this war. So there's a little bit of tidbit of info that you might not have known. Forget about the chat. I will not forget about super chats. If you have a question or you just want to throw in a super chat and show some support and love, I'll read them and focus on them, okay? But if you're just a pleb in the chat, no matter how good your message is, was this session archived on any YouTube channels? Uh, I think Dempsey has unlisted archives, but they're like private. Other than that, just my footage. Pine over to China, please, show us the horde. Now hold on, hold on, I'll get there, okay? Let's look at the Albion position. So. What do we think of the Albion position? It's perfectly good positioning if he's going to fight just me and maybe the dual monarchy, but it's... Um, I actually don't know. He's not on the Scandinavian border at the start, and it's Scandi who de uh, decks the war. I don't think he's expecting the Scandinavian move, clearly, by his body language. So he moves his troops He's not holding Kiel at the start, so Scandinavia moves in and takes Kiel when he decks the war. And then the Albions presumably take some of these troops and positions them in Hamburg, Lauenburg and Lübeck. And by the way, I did do a lot of war analysis for the first one in part 17. Uh, I did actually do war analysis on that in the video, so a lot of it's already covered, but I'll just go over it again. Maybe when, it, when we get moving on part 17 we can sort of go faster and then focus more on part 18. So he moves his troops to those three provinces, and that's a point that I've raised already. Those three provinces are just terrible to hold. There isn't even a single river crossing, and they're all plains. So if, if Scandi's in that, he does have to launch three whole battles to, to move in, but it's really bad for the Albions. So what he should be holding, and I did suggest this in the video. I did suggest this. It's uh, Obviously that forest is really good. It's one province, and then... I basically, I think in the video I suggested, you know, that. Well, let me delete that. Uh, that. I don't know, something like that. Maybe hold that. You know, you know, something like that. Roughly like that, right? Uh, thank you, Emperor Malgus, for the upcoming $2, which hasn't been alerted yet. And thank you, Henry, for the £5. Imagine not having money, lol. Uh, some of us like being plebs. Super chat plebs rise up. Thank you, Henry. Thanks for the two super chats, guys. Why are you not holding the two f the forest tiles on the left of Nuremberg? Third time I'm asking. Whoa, okay. Listen, mate. Third time I'm asking. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold on. I'll explain in a minute. I'll explain my positioning as well. Why am I not holding the two the forest tile two tiles left of Nuremberg? Okay. Oh, I still have the Gilded Destiny alert from the Gilded Destiny partly stream, discussion stream. I'm fine with that anyway. So, the reason I'm not holding my full front line, as a matter of fact, is because, and this is more at the end of part 16, um, now, you've got to remember the context here, and I guess I am talking about diplomacy. At the end of part 16, the Albion Confederation mobilised, and I didn't have any allied troops in my borders, and I thought they were going to deck on me very quickly. I thought I was just being decked on by the Elbians and maybe PLC and I would be alone. It was across the time between sessions that Scandinavia came up with this plan, and I do think I said as much in the thingy, in the video as well. Just for some chats. So, I'm not the only one here who's not really aligned on the border in the right way based on what the war's going to be. There's a bit of uncertainty about what the sides are going to be. Because I thought I was going to end up being outnumbered. Built concrete factory. Thank you very much, Thomas, for the $10. Sure. I'll build a, a concrete factory 
or a cement factory in this. You know, I'm, play I'm playing the Bavaria series right now. Thank you, Kaiser, for the two euros. Thank you so much. So I'm not holding the front line against the Albians, basically because I thought I was going into this war outnumbered. I didn't know Scandi was coming at the time. But it didn't matter anyway, because I just moved up and then went in here, as you're about to see in the actual footage. Is there anything else about the opening positions? Well, I guess Poland also doesn't realise what's going to happen, because he's fully lined up to prepare for just a Russian war. But he ends up joining the Albians anyway. And this is a point that I'll go on to sort of make, right? I'll, I'll say at the end of part 18 or whatever... I'm trying to convince Poland to not bother helping the Albians so much. Uh, and maybe the Albians promising him the region of Posen, which he transferred after this war, convinced Poland to really come in to do this, even though his main focus should and is Russia, should be Russia. So what's the Asian Hogbox doing at the same time, right? They're not even ready. This is like three years before they joined. They're just sitting around in their Hogbox doing nothing. Right, China's army. He's got troops in India. Um, also, yeah, look, look at the Ottoman positioning as well. <clears throat> this also goes back to part sixteen, when you still had the original Ottoman player, who was actually afraid of the hug box and was doing diplomacy with me to stop our wars so he could focus on the hug box, and he's also focused on Ethiopia. Right. There was just such a big shift between those sessions, therefore between part 16 and 17, right? The war that happened was not what was being built up to in part 16 and that session. The substitutes that came in on Poland, Ottomans, Ethiopia and India, for that matter, all sort of, it kind of changed things a lot. Uh, and as well as Scandinavia's move, he's not a substitute. Was Ottomans going to fight India? Well, there was no actual war planned at the time, but that was what was clearly building up, and that's what the Ottoman player expected. He was fearful of the hug box, and he was trying to put aside his beef with me so he could focus on that, which was beneficial for me. I mean, I went all over this in part 17, maybe 18 anyway. We'll just have to wait and see what's next in part 19 and whatnot. But yeah, hello to everyone who's just tuning in now. So, obviously Spain is over here not prepared to join the war. And Italy is not prepared to join the war at all. He's been paid off, remember. He's not there to join. Spain is only sending troops through here to go to Aragon, because he's at war with Aragon. The dual monarchy is the only one who's with me here. Right. So. What are the Ottoman stacks? Let's see his composition. Um, I think I know why the Ottomans has small stacks. He has, wait, he has electricity. I don't know. I was thinking maybe he's afraid of taking attrition in the mountains, but what are these stacks? These are mobilized stacks. So, I mean, maybe he was prepared for war with India, but he is putting his mobilized stacks over here, which is where you would, you would normally keep them behind the line and then build them with mobilization. Who knows? Um, what's his tech? Yeah, his tech's good. His literacy 61. Yeah, the Ottomans has built up his country fine. It's built up his country well. Anyway. Anyway, anyway, anyway. Appreciate the super chats, guys. So, we can close the actual game for now. So here's the thing about this, right? Um, yeah, uh, there will be no spoilers. There's no possible spoiler here, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Yeah, we're fine. I can... Uh, I took the future saves of this campaign out of the folder temporarily. Uh, wait, wait, wait. So, I've got the save games. This is the one... Well, this is like the first save in the middle of the war. This is the one at the start of the war. And then I've got the save, which is... Well, this is the end of the war, and then this is the peace deal. So, the saves are very good. I've removed all the saves from the campaign out of this folder, which are beyond the war, so there's no possible spoilers. So, uh, And what you have through here are, like eight seven eight snapshots during the war that we can sort of go and look at whenever they come up but the footage will be the main thing right so we'll come back to the actual vic 2 at various points and
Oh, the, these guys who are spamming the Among Us thing are giving me super chats now. I'll take it. Thanks for the two pounds. Thanks for the two pounds. Right. Okay. Put that there. Back in this. Who had the best general of that war? Ooh, good question. Maybe look at that in a future... Let me look at one of the future saves. Um, fucking... Lazar de Gaulle is one of the best, right? I've made a little community post about him. Anyway. This whole footage, the whole war... First thing to point out, you can see it right here, is that the whole war is about an hour and 38 minutes. I've edited out the rehosts. Okay, so it is actually edited but only to get rid of the rehosts and there's no audio i'm going to just talk over it the audio has been removed and there is a little section but this is like 50 minutes later when we get to that rule dispute i didn't edit out the whole rule dispute pause which is kind of pointless so i will try and skip ahead of that but it's only like a couple of minutes so i mean look the war begins i'm at war with the albion scandi decked it and we have this whole confusion whether poland is joining it or not that's one of the initial things. Uh, cheers for the super chat. So, as you can see, I'm moving forward to the whole the full border because the situation has changed from what I thought. And we actually... Oh, and of course, another point I forgot to mention when I was talking about where we're holding is I also thought Burgundy would be in it from the start, right? And that's why I didn't hold the whole border. I held a line. I held a line that was more... Wait, wait, wait. Actually, no, no. Wait. I've got more details. I've got, I've got more micro details for you. Something else I should have pointed out about the shape. To go back to that guy's question about why not hold all the provinces here, it's the shape of the provinces. So this is a forest, but it can be encircled, right? Very easily. Watch. I can draw arrows. I love doing this. Um, so if the Albians comes up and takes Würzburg, attack there. And if he's holding Council out and attack there, Mannheim is encircled. And I know that that is because I'm not holding the rest of the border. But if I were to hold the front border, the Albians backed up by Burgundy would be holding these two provinces. And they would come round anyway. So holding these would be devastating. And like they, would, they could all be encircled. But that, that's what I was prepared for. From part 16, early 17. That's not what actually happened. Um, and basically that's all down to Scandinavia. And I talked about the Scandinavian Diplo in part 18 at the end. So. Did the DM gain any land from the war? No, Emperor Malgus, but thank you for the $2. Uh, that's not what I'm trying to focus on, though. I'm trying to focus on the micro and the shapes. Indonesia left. What are you talking about? Were we talking about the Indonesia in the war as well? He held the forest tile, two tiles to the left of Nuremberg. Yeah, is that what we're... Yeah, that, you're the guy who asked the question. This is Dread, by the way. Glad to finally see your extended analysis. Good. Great to have you here. And uh, again, congrats on your first ever war. You forgot to disable resample in the unedited video. Yeah, look, it's fine. I only paused it on a really bad frame there. I paused it on a really uh, blurry frame. I'll try to avoid that. Right. These people ch like spamming the chud gun thing are from some weird discords that I'm advertising. Like I'm advertising these people's discords in my my Vic Two multiplayer's, you know, channel. And how do they repay me by coming to spam me on my streams? It's okay for you to spam me and ping me on your servers that I join, right? To all you fucking idiots. But don't come and do this on my stream, okay? That's my, very much appreciated, okay? Thanks for the two pounds, though. Cool effect. Yeah, I should add more of these. I should add more motion blur to my videos. Right. Let's get on with this, shall we? Where are we? Oh, yes, we're 20 seconds into the war. We're making great progress. This is me checking if New Centa New Centara joins on our side. And then I notice that Batavia doesn't join. You know, great stuff. And we're moving in. The video quality might not be great, but whatever. We get the idea. This is the unedited footage, and I am slowly, slowly moving up. Mm. 
Nusantara requests aid. So eventually, and we can, you know, there's, we have time. We might as well, and okay, like this is me panning over Poland because we're confused at what Poland is doing, right? There is actually a lot of voice chat interaction with the Poland player that we did that I edited out because it was toxic. Just, just letting you know. That won't even be in the deleted scenes. It's too personal about the Poland sub crafter. So I didn't include it at all. Vic video in a Vic stream, Vic vidception. That's right. Hey, thank you so much for the $10. I appreciate that very, very much. So we can fast forward to the first battle, right? Because kind of irrelevant until then. I'm taking things very slowly and oh here's another move we were trying to make so because Poland wasn't joining the war or at least we thought Poland wasn't joining the war I wanted to do an attack on Brno which might have been a good move if Poland wasn't joining the war because the Albians is focusing his army to the west and we might have caught him off a little bit there but this attack will be called off because Poland does announce to join the war also, whatever YouTube's recommending me is based on nothing. It's doing some shit about the Ukraine war. Don't care. I didn't watch any of that on this. I'm logged out. So that's just what YouTube naturally recommends based on my Victoria videos. Real war. Cheers, mate. So this is the sort of thing... Well... You get an idea here, like as we watch the full footage and how basically nothing's happening, you can get an idea of how I edit the video, right? So a lot of this guff can be edited out, right? We're just kind of preparing a, an offensive against Poland that never actually happened. Did I even get to the point of ordering it? Yes, I got to the point of ordering it. And then Poland pauses and then says joining Albion immediately when I start and then I stop. Right? So I couldn't, I didn't even finish the attack. Anyway, we can skip forward to the actual first battle, which will happen in Castle. And I'm microing my general to try and get, here's a funny thing. Uh, this was sort of shown in the video. I have a four attack general, right? Called Edward von Hartmann there, you see him? That's my four attack general. He is a general that was kind of subject to being taken over by other generals so that's why ultimately the dual monarchy's four attack general who also has two defense to beef up his stats will take over i told the dual monarchy to do that and that's the legend himself lizard lazar de gaulle but i'm getting ahead of myself when are you going to do an ad about vic 3 never bra scandi wasn't primoed like i said this is all it was all the plans all changed sort of short term, didn't they? Spud gun playing defense to convince us his watch history isn't cringe. I swear to god that's the truth. I haven't watched anything on this logged out browser that I'm using here, you know. <laughs> Apparently if you let YouTube just recommend shit on my videos unadulterated by your own history, it does that. There's also a very, 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 very interesting point to make here. Right, that I will make shortly about what happens. Um, do you remember? And okay, right. This battle, Cassel. This is the only battle in the entire war, I think, where I actually showed the casualties of an individual battle. Uh, the fascinating thing about this battle, the first battle of the war, Cassel. It's the biggest battle in the war, and you can see that if you look at my the war anal the war analyzer screenshot uh, at the end of part eighteen and part 17. So this battle, the first one, and you know, I take heavy casualties initially because I get a bad roll and my general is being taken over by an inferior general until the dual monarchy gets here. And this battle is completely useless on, it's useless on its own. It, it will not win the war or advance on its own, but I just felt that I wanted to get the ball rolling, so I wanted to just attack him in the most obvious easy place to attack just to get the thing started. Just to do something because i felt we were under so much pressure having truces ticking and lack of money as everyone was saying in the vc i felt obliged to do an attack so i just did one right and 
Let's see if we can find the point where I start stressing over my general. So my general is here now, he's taking over. The Albion has a three defense in. I'm being careful there to take out a general who might potentially take over. I might go in fine. Hey Spud, why is the audio muted? Good question, Honk, who has a YouTube channel and just released a fucking new series. The reason the audio is muted is because I'm just doing my own analysis over the actual war and talking about the micro. If you want the audio, watch the videos and see us chatting about it and doing Diplo or whatever. So... This is like late August and I believe our next save is around late August, so we can take a moment here. August 27th-ish. When's the save? I'm tabbing out. I'm tabbing back into my Victoria here. Uh, 29th of August 1884. Alright, we'll go back to the game then. There he is, Lazar de Gaulle. Lazar de Gaulle has taken over the battle. The hero. The dual monarchy hero. Oh, this is why there's a save on the 29th of August. Oh, and I just, I edited out the rehost. So we rehosted on the 29th of August. It's a double-edged sword when you rehost because obviously you have to rehost and it's really annoying. But for me, editing the video later, I get a save, right? Because you have to take a save. Right, so I've got a save on the 29th of August. I'm going to show Big Weevil's POV for this. I'm going to show the Arcadian Union point of view for this particular scene and show you something. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Turn off for, uh, for the war. Or turn it on, rather. Uh, um, right. This is a really funny thing about this, right? Uh, this w might have happened a bit earlier. Wait, 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 hold on. Yeah, so at this point, and you'll remember this in the video, it's like in the voice chat, Big Weevil urges me to move around Munster and Dortmund and everything and try and encircle them. And these movements are not accurate right now because the AI is doing it, okay? So just imagine that every unit in the war is currently standing still. Um, I didn't know this at the time of playing, obviously, and I only sort of uncovered this later while editing. Um, from my point of view, I cannot see Moonster. So I'm assuming there's Albion troops behind the line and in that forest in Moonster, right? But Big Weevil here is urging me at this time to do it because he can see the Albions. He's allied to them. That's my point. Maybe unknowingly, I don't. He he wasn't. He clearly didn't know. He wasn't talking about giving me unfair vision or anything. But maybe unknowingly and subconsciously. So this is this explains why Weevil was like, "Oh my God, it's so obvious! Move round, move round." But not for me, from my point of view, because I can't see the Albion backline, and he's not telling me there's no backline. He's just telling me to move. So maybe that's an interesting little tidbit in the war. And also by this point, Scandi still hasn't launched his offensive because he's, you know, Scandi really hesitates in this war at the start for some reason because he was shadow funding and all that, you know, the poverty segment of the video. And that was a mistake, obviously, but it's fine anyway. We eventually do push. Why didn't England help you guys if he was supposed to be a vassal of Scandinavia? Um, because... He's sort of a vassal, but he is also an independent country. He didn't have money. He wasn't feeling like he was gaining anything out of the war. He wasn't interested in the European conflict. So, the live studio audience is applauding for this wonderful war analysis. Are you actually clapping? What are you doing? Are you clapping? All right. Big Sneasville keeps getting away with it. This isn't a big issue. I'm not saying this was something terribly unfair, but I just thought it was really interesting. I, I mean, I remember when I initially edited through this section, without knowing, I was like, why is Big Weevil so insistent on me trying to move around like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight provinces to encircle the Albions? I'm like, why is he so insistent on that? Because I'm only editing my footage, I can see just fog of war. 
like this. If you look at that, you don't know what the Albion's has back, like there. So, at the time I'm editing it, I'm thinking, what? And then suddenly I get a eureka moment and go, wait, I'm going to go into the save on the 29th of August and check what Alliance's Weevil has. Oh my god, he was allied to the Albion's. Cheeky bastard. And then, of course, in part 18, he will join our side. Spoilers. Right. Um, I always clap the guys at the orchestra. Oh, it must have been a clap in the background music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Background music. If you ever go to an orchestra, I bet you have a cough. The only, you know, people love to go to the orchestra with a cough, don't they? Okay. So, you know, this battle just rages on and on for a while. Hence, it's the biggest battle in the war in terms of casualties, obviously. I talked to the England player and he just said he was gaslighting Scandi the entire time into thinking he would join the next war. Honk is, Honk is my uh, England correspondent. He's on the ground in London right now speaking to the Prime Minister behind the scenes. What was Elbia thinking giving away so much of his land? That's a diplomatic thing that I can't really answer myself. Anyway, so I, I don't think I'll mention that too much. Spugun realising two years later. This is me telling Scandi to do his offensive, I guess. And also, bargaining goes out of sync. <laughs> Crazy. The stuff you edit out. That's me telling Scandi to, to do his offensive. That's a transfer of Terrania and China going on behind the scenes as well. So much stuff going on you don't necessarily know about. What is your view on other alt history mods? Oh, I don't know. I'm not going to talk about that right now. Wait. Oh, this is me. This, like, oh, the audio's cut out. I'm, I don't have the audio, but this is me ranting about the Ottomans, famously. Having a, a fucking meltdown about the Ottomans joining. And understandable too, right? Understandable too. Oh, another thing I want to point out, I kind of, I did explain this in part 17, but um, Poland initially didn't join the war, the game on pause for a bit, and then he said joining Albions and accepted the call to arms. So he had actually bypassed the amount of time that you're allowed to accept a defensive call, yet he did it and joined. So Dempsey ruled that he had to stay out of the war for three months, right? So he wasn't allowed to fight. He was technically in the war, but he wasn't allowed to fight. And then, I don't know, he gets allowed to fight later. Like now, nah, he's allowed to fight now. Dempsey would have announced it previously. What are we pausing here for? This is the next rehost. No. This is the, the uh, Ottomans joining. I don't want to get into the diplomacy of the Ottomans joining, though. I really, try, I really want to focus on the, the combat and the war here. And currently, oh, this is, so Poland has sent his troops all the way around now because he's actually joined the war and he's actually fighting. So they launched their offensive into Korbar. More people talking about the Ottoman diplomacy, I guess, but I, that's, that's not the point right now here. Um, but I will just say again that it was a substitute coming onto the Ottomans in part 17 who changed his policy from part 16. Uh, and that often happens, and you do... Ha I mean, as, as as shitty as it is to go through that as the enemy of the Ottomans, I mean, it happens in VIC-2 multiplayer. So countries get substituted, and then they might change what they were doing, or the original player might not give the substitute the instructions and the context, so it happens. You have to be ready for it. How many Danubians are actually living in the Ottoman Danube area? Well, while I have a game open, I will go on a little tangent and look at pops. Sure, why not? I can do it. Right. Uh, so, Saxon, Bayern, Franken, Österreich, Central Hungary. It's 10% Danubian. Central Hungary is this one. 10% Danubian overall. And then Trans Danubia is 25%, a quarter. And that's the one where I will get a baby boom later in the war. So 25% Danubian is not that bad. Um, 
I don't have any stats to hand about how much that grew the population there. I might show you that in part 19 if I remember. Um, because that's like a few years later you can see the effect. Anyway, next time you want me to do a little tangent about something else like Pops though, it's got to be a super chat. But that time I was generous. Um, okay, back to this. Alright, so Poland launches his offensive with Albion support there. And I get, just look at the position of it, right? They, they're not holding the province of Dortmund or Minden behind it. So, I, I mean, I basically start to launch an encirclement manoeuvre as soon as that... Well, I call it off there because the Albions does move round. But that weakness will be exposed later. Although they, I mean, they do hold it properly now. But it will be exposed later, spoiler alert. Unexpected regime change. Yeah, it does, in a, a weird way, represent real life a little bit. When there's a regime change, like Russia in the seven, yeah, Russia in the Seven Years' War, for example. So I put my John Cena general into that defensive one, or do we not have a better general? Maybe, let's see if I click on that battle, call back. Again, um, we have a bit of a white, we can see Scandinavia up there, who still hasn't fucking launched his offensive, which is ridiculous, right? Um, well, then launching that second offensive and moving around the front line is part of the overall sort of mistake in their strategy that I talked about. Because, and it's it's really down to Scandinavia not launching his offensive. If if Scandinavia did launch his offensive in three battles, then the enemy side would have felt the urgency on needing to retreat to a better line. Because Poland hasn't got its whole army over, they're overstretched. It's just Poland and the Albians at this stage in the war. So like I said at the end of part 17, this line is not holdable for them. Like when we gather momentum in the southern front, they're, they're getting grounded down in those two, you know, grinding late-game battles with machine guns. Particularly they're taking more casualties in their offensive one, but they're still getting... They're still cycling our offensive one. So these two battles are essentially weakening, weakening them for the grand offensive that's coming up when Scandinavia actually finally goes in. How long was Dempsey's message for Poland there? Did Poland rule break an attack via Elbland early? Nah. I think he waited wait the three months. It doesn't really matter anyway. Too much. Uh, but, I mean, I think this might be the point where uh, Weevil actually does do his recommendation to attack ground. I mean, I don't think it happened as early as I... I don't think it happened in August with that save, but I think it happened later. You'll know if you watch the video. So I do cycle my John Cena out, so either that was a mistake or we do have a better defence general in that battle, I don't know. Another sort of mistake is, yeah, we probably do have too many troops holding Austria and the Hungarian border down south. That was more so later in the war, we'll come to that. We held, when Italy joins, we have too many troops down there. Right, you can see from my body language that I'm planning that attack round into Dortmund now. Ah, there you go. They retreated the Battle of Korbach, and this is when we start thinking about really following up. This is where it begins. Like I say, the, the Battle of Korbach was going horribly for them. They were taking bigger casualties. They were attacking into machine guns at this stage when they're kind of overstretched. Bad move. There, it begins. It begins.
then the attack in Castle is actually going pretty well for us. I think the enemy might be not getting full combat with there. They don't look like they have enough good troops in the battle, so they're taking more casualties. Isn't Memming in Encirclable? Um, yes. Yes, it is. Uh, I moved to it there. That's a situation where I'm pretty confident they won't do it because they're kind of overextended. They're already in one grinding battle. I do believe that they don't have the troops to do it. So I do leave that. Yeah, I mean, you're right to mention it. But I guess that's my, my thought process behind going in anyway. Like if you're if you're confident that the enemy won't launch an attack, then you can just hold the province. Oh, look at that! Wow, just when we were talking about it, I pull out. I guess I came to my senses. <laughs> I guess I came to my senses, and maybe, maybe you you just your message there, Kaiser, just got through to me two years ago. You you sent a message back in time through the ether and told me to not hold that province, because it can be encircled. I don't know how you did it. You got the message through to two years past me self there. But I'm taking them right, yeah. I'm taking them round to launch the grand, you know, flank, left flank offensive that we do. And at some point, as well, I'm going to realize that Scandinavia did launch his attacks, but I didn't know because he didn't communicate because his microphone went off, which is a crazy situation. And we also attack there, and Dortmund is about to be encircled. I'm doing the classic strat of leaving one stack behind, microing and moving forward. And then I notice Scandinavia has broken through. Because, I mean,. Given how overstretched the Elbians were, he didn't have a backline per se defending that very well. Scandinavia was... It was so easy for Scandinavia to push through that. Three provinces, three plains, no help, like no river crossing. Scandinavia has the luxury of putting on any attack generals he has. And that's Scandinavia and me linked already, fully linked. So furthermore, at this stage, right, at this stage, we're breaking through. Scandinavia's broken through the north. I've encircled Dortmund and we're pushing through. But the Battle of Kassel is still raging on. Um, I think they should have pulled out of Kassel, probably by this point. They, they should have pulled out of it. Obviously, right? And another thing to say at this point is... Clap for Scandi. Hmm. I think the only player which could have impact on your war was Burgundy, but thankfully your side is stretching. But well, we'll get to that, okay? We'll get to that. We'll get to that. So, um, this is also a stage where... If we played better, me, Scandinavia, dual monarchy, we could have encircled a lot more of them at, at this point. We could have ended, the, we could basically have ended the war early if we actually did manage to completely destroy the Elbian army here and what Poland has. But as you know, there was a breakdown in communication when Scandinavia's microphone fucking stopped working. I'm funneling more troops round through the breach in the Albion lines in order to reinforce the defensive thing in Nienburg. Scandinavia also did reinforce that. So they pull out of Minden and again they leave the Battle of Kassel grinding on and on. They should be pulling out of that too. Scandinavia is really close to a breakthrough in Lauenburg, I think, or Hanover. You know, the big province he's attacking with 110k. 
Albion sabotage. Ooh. The Albion's paying for Scandinavia's microphone to break. Right, this is actually the moment right here where Scandinavia's mic really breaks. And also, Lizard is announcing, Italy's announced to join the war as well. He did right after the Ottomans. So, I'm, you know, you, you see it in the video, but I'm urging Scandinavia to attack Han over here, and he doesn't do it with me because his microphone's not working and stuff. Thank you, Sven. I'm hesitating, I'm hesitating. I'm like, Scandi, come with me, Scandi, move, move, move. I should have just launched it anyway. You know, I do, but I should have... And that 1k, that 1k that Albion's builds actually prevents the offensive, right? Like, the hesitation and then that random Albion stack allows his troops to move out of Hanover. Which would have then been encircled easily because we won the Battle of Kassel. And then, yeah, all we would need to do there is attack Brunswick and then we encircle a lot of Albion stacks that were in Hanover. So that's the perfect example of how the Elbians manages to get away with a lot of troops. Like, we don't encircle that many in this opening phase, like we did in part 14 when we broke through around here. But we did get a nice encirclement in Dortmund, and um, I'm not sure exactly how many that is. I think it's just 60k, which is 20 brigades. So decent, right? It put a nice little bit of damage on the Elbian army. But also Scandinavia is really breaking through in the north. Like, look at how big he's breaking through in the north. With his broken microphone. The Albion is going to reinforce that. Another thing here, I mean, look. Look at the lines, right? Look how much the dual monarchy has behind us. Scandinavia also has troops. I have troops. We could easily be launching another offensive on the Albions, like... Even if it is in the forest of Gotha. I mean, there's also a possible encirclement, Weimar, Erfurt, Gotha, but... You know, all, overall we could have launched a lot more there. Thank you, El Emperor Malgus, for the $5. Albion sabotaging those undersea cables helped their side a lot. I have no comment. Just think, who benefits from Scandinavia's microphone breaking? Lunaberg, yeah. The Albion sabotaging those undersea cables helped their side a lot. Also, you know, Poland still has loads of troops defending against Russia at this point. We can't really see them. But Poland also manages army badly. And he's sitting there in Bohemia with 60Ks, right? We're not going to attack there, their hills, probably, so I think the enemy could split those in half and easily reinforce north instead. Also, the Albions did well to reinforce the battle in Stendal, because that one was critical. If Scandinavia actually broke through that one at that point, that would have been horrible. Uh, also, these things are disconnected, the new, you know, Pomerania is open. Either Scandinavia or the... The Albians could move round and encircle Stendhal through that, but neither side has the troops for it at this stage, because everyone's really depleted. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Brief glimpse of Virtual Rock's Russian front there. Have a look at that. Right, you, as you can see, yeah, Virtual Rock's completely breaking through. I made this point in the video, but I'm just going to reiterate it again. Poland trying to split his forces between holding the Russian Eastern Front and holding, I mean, supporting the Albians didn't work. It was terrible, 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 terrible strategy. I mean, either. He doesn't help the Elbians at all and just focuses on Russia. Or he commits to the Elbians and takes all his troops away from Russia because the ones he left against Russia just get wiped and have to retreat. You can't split your forces to do, to, to do both things. It doesn't work.
They were probably planning our next offensive here, and I'm hesitant to attack forests, so... Standal would be a good attack there. This is, uh... Figuring out why I can't call Wizard into the war. I think I still need to deck on him to add the sphere. I don't know. Wait, China transported its forces near Crimea. They are not serious forces. They weren't actually putting into Poland to join the war. Like, they've been there for a long time. I, I showed them in the video. They were a bit ominous. Why not try pushing into Czechia? Too hilly. Basically, yes, too hilly. I didn't even consider it. When there's so many possible planes to attack in, there's, if you can avoid it, there's no point. Because, as you can see here, I want to attack Stendhal. No round of applause for that song. And finally the attack will begin, although the Albians has really reinforced that other battle, can't remember the name of the province, in Brandenburg there, and Scandinavia is kind of losing it and he's not cycling very well in that battle. Hi Water Hazard and everyone in the chat, hi. This is like a war analysis section but you can say hi. I mean, if you look, if you look at this, the Albions is holding well in these battles. He's defending. He could be clearly cycling a lot better. He has a lot of depleted stacks and low morale stacks in the front bat in the in the battles, but he's holding us off this time. Unlike part fourteen. What if Scandinavia split his army to help Russia in the east? Would that be more forgivable than Poland? No, it's, it's redundant and pointless for even Scandinavia to do that. Oh, this is the... the Slovakian nationalist rebels. And there's really nothing we can do to help them. I'm quite new to this game and I was wondering what exactly does Forest and Hills do? They provide a bigger defence penalty to attackers, so if you're holding... Uh, a forest gives minus one to attack for the attacker. Also a river crossing. Yeah, it's just defensive. Is Aragon in this war? They're AI. They do actually join the war, but they're AI and I don't even know how they got called in. Because they're later seen occupying fucking the Ottomans for some reason. I swear they're in it later. Yeah, they do also reduce combat width, which has other effects. Is it just like EU4 terrain? I think so. I don't know too much about EU4, but I'm pretty sure it works the same. So, I mean, yeah, this is the front line. I'm these are the battles that are grinding on. Two battles. If these two battles keep grinding on and on, I mean, I think our side has the advantage. We have more troops. And we are close. I mean, I can reinforce well. But yeah, that's a, that's a good attack for me to launch effort. That is the right thing to do there. And also, I'm absolutely bamboozled to learn that they've pulled out of Bohemia. The Polish troops that were holding the line moved away, and I'm not exactly sure why. Either it's the Slovak nationalists, although I don't see them being killed yet, or maybe he had to go and reinforce the Eastern Front against Virtual Rock, or he's gone up to reinforce the other existing battles, but... Yeah, they pulled out of Bohemia. It's 
not necessarily that bad an idea, because there is more defensible terrain in Dres and Elsig and Haraditz behind them, behind them there, but... If I was feeling a lot more aggressive, I could have moved around Dresden and shit, Leipzig, but I, I, I am trying to move through Leipzig because they left it open. The enemy side having a little bit of chaos there, and they're losing the ongoing battles, so we're having another breakthrough here. Another big breakthrough. I thought this game was much more recent than two years. Well, why have you decided to create a series based on a game that happened so long ago? I answer that a lot at this point. The series is take a long time to make. And it, when I was playing this, right? When I was doing this, this footage, when I was doing this, I was currently making the Venice series. And then I guess, like, after the Venice series, Victoria 3 comes out. So... Some things sidetracked me, I guess, you could say. But I've said it before and I'll say it again. Old Victoria 2 footage doesn't really make much difference because the footage, it stands the test of time because the game's not being updated and stuff. It's I, Footage from a long time ago can still work today. It's very, it's completely fine. It's not like EU4 or something, or Hoi4, where if you have footage from years ago, the game will have been updated beyond... Uh, recognition and it'll be really outdated. Is that Spudgun from Persistent Worlds Mountain Blade? Yeah, just go on my channel and look and see my amazing old Mountain Blade videos. People are still finding it so surprising that this campaign happened in March, April, May 2022. Are you still surprised at that? Come on. I do remember, like, throughout this whole time that I've been holding on to this footage, Lizard, I think, messed, like, said on my Discord so many times. You know, I'm waiting for Spud to make that series. People, <laughs> the people who played in it have been waiting for me to make it for ages. You mentioned in a comment having two more potential series for After Bavaria. Is that still the case? Yeah, I have, I have footage. I have backlog. I have a backlog of footage. I do indeed. Uh, at least two full series worth of backlog footage as it is, let alone other bits and pieces here and there, and future stuff I can record now. I don't know why that sounded like a proper interview question. You should only ask proper interview questions in a super chat. Oh, by the way, I think I might have missed... Yeah. Look, uh, wait, wait, wait. wait until it's not a fucking blur frame. Deso, 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 Deso. Look, it's kind of open. If we could have attacked Halle and made it through to Berlin there, that is, well, just Magdeburg encircled, really. But Deso is a, a weird province, right? It's small and it's loosely connected to Erfurt and also Berlin. The whole shape of Brandenburg and Anhalt regions and provinces is weird. Anyway, do you have a full VOD channel? Right, so uh, these campaigns that I tend to make videos out of are just recorded, but I do have streams as well. So you can see my streams on the second VOD channel, which should be in the description. The Spudgun Archives. Skip ahead a bit, because I skip back. I would donate, but I already spent too much on Bud. Another time. But I'm your Bud. At this point, you know, I'm thinking of adding tickers and trying to get this war over with. Because, yeah, we still have that looming Burgundian truce on the back of our minds throughout this whole thing, as well as the money situation. So I'm thinking, oh, can I ticker him out? 
The rules state that you do have to take everything you add. You're not allowed to add extra tickers that you're not taking in the peace deal. But still, if I can add a region that I'm taking, it's still a, a valid ticker. I, I'm in like two videos getting absolutely disgusting couch from you. I've been playing a bit of Bannerlord lately as well, you know. I've been playing a lot of Bannerlord off stream, but I also played it on a stream the other day and it was a lot of fun. I've got my skill level up quite high in Bannerlord. I'm a little bit surprised actually how good I am at this point. Because I always thought I was quite shit at Bannerlord compared to Warband, but no, I've been, I've been getting good. I will go to Persistent Empires, Empires and Bannerlord at some point I'll play it again. Don't read the chat. Look at the in-game chat, don't read it. Rudeness is happening between the players. I mean, yeah, what's there to analyse in the war right now? It's just a grand offensive from us in Anhal, all four provinces of it, and we're grinding the enemy down, but we're also taking high casualties ourselves. Um, one thing to say is, I guess, the Ottoman impact on the war hasn't been great yet. The Ottomans hasn't sent much of his troops up to the front line. He's still mostly just sieging down, well, he isn't even sieging down Hungary. I don't even, I don't even know what he's doing, to be honest. He's just sitting in Poland. Actually, he's probably on the Eastern Front, that's what it is. When's my next save? When's my next save? I think the Ottomans actually went to the Russian Front, and that actually does make a lot of sense. He was mainly used to shore up that front, but we're still winning, you know, on the Western Front. He should have sent a lot more there. So my next save is on uh, 11th of February 1885, but you can't see the date behind my name. June 1885. So I've missed a point where we took a, a save, I guess. So when's the actual next save? Um, oh, the, yeah, there's a long period without a save. The next save is actually in the 20th of February 1887. So almost two years happened without a rehost, which is good. But I missed a lot of stuff. There were I couldn't. It's the reason I couldn't take an accurate war analyzer mid-war at the end of part 70. The episodes will change in like 1886, I think. Uh, did the Burgundy player have a reaction to how he was depicted in your series? Like how you now viewed him as an underdog? Well, the, the, the Burgundy players loved it. He's been... He's cringed at hearing his own voice, though. You know, and his laughs. But everyone... You know, he's turned out to be... Uh, the sort of... I don't know, another... A very sympathetic country. And I didn't, re I didn't remember it being like that. Because from my point of view, I was against him most of the time. Right? But when I also edited it and looked back on it, I realised, oh yeah, I see. Yeah. I get it from his point of view now. Did the Burgundy player have a reaction to how he was depicted in your series? Like how you now view him as an underdog. All those people talking about... Uh... Calradian Rhapsody. Do you know I made a part two and did the whole song? Did you know that? Look up Calradian Rhapsody 2. I made it like two years ago. Safe to say it did not get as many views as Calradian Rhapsody 1. The next big move that happens in the war is probably one of our big encirclements somewhere around fucking uh, Pomerania and Pritzwalk. Because if you look at it, it's open, right? Pomerania is open, more or less. So eventually they're going to get pushed back to Brandenburg or something and then Pomer we'll do a Pomerania offensive. That's when the next bit will happen. Part 1 slapped more though. Part 1 is inside Part 2. Part 2 is the whole song, Part 1 is just the operatic section. And I use Part 1. How long you reckon until we reach all hell breaking loose? Well, still quite a while yet. Still quite a while until that happens. Like, 10 minutes. I might speed up though. Okay, this is when we see Virtual Rock kind of overextending for the first time. At that point, I think I'm just saying, good job. 
but later we're really going really gonna to notice how much he's overextending. Because I completely lost track at all hell breaking loose. So that was kind of the point of the video. That bit was meant to just be absolute ridiculous chaos that somehow eventually turned into us generally having the upper hand and Burgundy dying. But what we're really going to do here, we're going to be able to really break it down when we get to that point in the stream. And that's kind of the, pur the purpose of it. I'm going to skip ahead. We're, I, I'm looking north now, so I'm probably telling Scandi to do an offensive or something or reinforce that battle. Right, so this is us breaking through that first wave. We, they're pulling back to Brandenburg. Yeah. They just didn't reinforce very well. The Ottomans, the Ottomans is not supporting them enough. We really outnumber them on this front. Do you think the war would have gone even better if Russia didn't overextend? Yes, of course. The Asian hunk box might not have even joined. There's local asking to be unserver muted in chat. I'll just move myself there so you can see the date. So yeah, we've, we've just pushed through another wave of their defences, but we didn't wipe anything in that situation. So they can reinforce, although the Albanians must be struggling now because he's really getting war exhaustion and most of his good industry has been sieged. The attacks that we launched down here are bad, and the reason for that is that the Ottomans are really present on that part of the front, unlike the north. The Battle of Berno there was an absolute disaster. Now, here's the, the Elbian Rebellion, of course. We all know what happened there, it never came to anything, so... Wait, no, no, I, I got... No, the all hell breaking loose doesn't happen until... Like, almost there. It happens late in the war. Yeah, it's like here. This is Burgundy moving across in like 1 hour 08, so it does, I, I got it wrong. What I looked at was probably Burgundy coming across to kill rebels. So the, the hell breaking loose section doesn't happen yet. And it just... Getting to see this whole thing in its full context, right, and the full length of it. You get to see how long this whole thing happens in real time. It's, um, again... It's about an hour of raw fighting, an hour of real time before Burgundy even joins the war. And that doesn't include the time spent rehosting. So, I don't know, an hour and a half. Mostly fighting, and then Burgundy joins. So, on the one hand, that gives us an hour of, you know, focusing, right? By the time Burgundy actually joins the war, we're all completely immersed. We're in the zone. We're fighting. We're strategizing. We've got our communication down. And then, and maybe, it, it seems like maybe it's a bit of an abstract reason, but maybe that's another reason why Burgundy kind of flopped. Because he just came in suddenly, right? He didn't have, he wasn't in the zone from fighting a war for the past hour like we were. And maybe there were nerves and um, not so good communication among the enemy alliance. It could all, that could be a factor. Locked in. And these are the sort of things no one really talks about, but they do have an impact. Look at the Ottomans there. 168k stack there. I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> so, yeah, there's actually no battles going on. I think this must be the point where I'm going to shadow fun soon, because there's no battles. We're just really 
And we're very, very happy with where we are in the war here. Virtual Rock, he's overextended, but he is sieging down most of Poland. Or occupying most of it. And we've occupied most of the Albion Confederation, or two-thirds of it. So we're really happy with our position at this point, And we're basically just, and there's my shadow funding. We're just kind of wondering, when are they going to surrender? It's over. Burgundy is still a year in-game away from joining. And they're this siege down and fucked. They haven't encircled the Russian army yet. Uh, and then, well, Scandinavia launches that attack. It looks really good there. Sc Poland had no uh, general, but that ends up not being such a good attack. They got a good roll. Don't forget to like the stream, guys. Yes, that's right. Like the stream. Like the stream. Help it get out there. I actually don't help it get out there. I don't want this to be the first bit of Bavaria content anyone watches. This is supposed to be a, an add-on, if you've watched up to the point in the whole series so far. If you if you haven't watched any of the Bavaria series yet, watch it before you watch this, okay? This is a spoiler. I should have made this a channel member only stream and then I would have had like two viewers. Look, you can see the Scandinavian offensive turning out really badly. No, don't dislike the stream. Disliking, look, oh, look at that. I'm thinking, oh, Bargany's going to join soon. I better get troops on their border. Well. It's still like almost a year away until you can join. The truce ends in November 1886, remember? And it's currently December 1885. But I'm still looking ahead to it. Because we're not currently fighting any battles. And I'm kind of thinking, well, we might be reaching a sort of stalemate here. So might as well just prepare for Burgundy a little bit. And start thinking about that. And uh, yeah, there's Russia, dangerously overextended. This is a little bit blurry, but it get, we can get the point across. The fact that this is not the end of this war shows some real commitment to game ruining. No, no, it's not game ruining. Just look, look at Virtual Rock's fucking position. I mean, for God's sake, you know, what was he thinking, guys? He could have held his flanks even. And there's, there's a bit where I encourage him to at least um, occupy Prezem missile. Ultimately, the main thrust of the enemy encirclement came from the north. So he probably should have been holding Allenstein, even though it's a plane. But... Yeah, just... And, and just look at the numbers, right? Look at the numbers the enemy have, compared to what Virtual Rock has. It's just not good. Now, you, you know, he's cut off from us. He really should have just been holding some forests. You know, imagine this is vanilla, and imagine this is the Russian Empire. All of the PLC territory is part of Russia, and you know, imagine this is a Germany or a Prussia and an Austria. Right? Russia tends to hold the forest line back here, around Belarus and Ukraine. That's what this Russia should be doing too, right? Basically where I'm putting my cursor. And I know he's probably thinking, well, I've got to link up with my allies, just pushing as far as I can. But when you really think about the situation, like there's no, there's no clear chance of breaking through to, to link up with each other. The enemy holds a really narrow corridor, but they hold it nonetheless, and they hold it very strongly with a lot of troops. Because remember, we barely, we haven't killed much of the Albion army by this point. It's still mostly intact. Oh, and yeah, the, everyone knew what happened here, right? Everyone knew what happened here with the the ghost, the Indian Ghost Brigade. We do have a Zenmos doodle if anyone wants to see.
For those of you who don't watch many of my live streams, Zenmos here likes to make some drawings and doodles, and they're great. I love them. Um, we'll take a pause here, though, to let you know. I mostly stream on Twitch these days, right? I, I stream my games on Twitch, and I do discussions and stuff like this on YouTube. So, check out my Twitch. I'm currently... I don't know what I'm doing currently. I just played the Millennia demo, and I'm planning... Well, I'm going to be continuing a comfy playthrough of Raft that I've been doing with Pychucker, hopefully when he's feeling better. I've been doing more single-player content on Twitch. Uh, I've stepped back a lot from streaming multiplayer Vic 2 lately because I found it stressful. I might return to it at some point though and I'll let you know. But the single player streams have been really good. They really have. Because DoD Fanfork, which I've been mostly playing, has a lot of content and I'm doing just a lot of good chit chat with the viewers. But you know, I'm having a bit of a problem lately, you know. The Twitch people aren't subscribing very much at the moment. I'm having a bit of a drought, you know. But, you know, I come here to YouTube and, oh, this, the Super Chats is great. Great to be back on YouTube to hoover up these amazing Super Chats from the amazing YouTube viewers. Unlike all the Twitch people who aren't subscribing right now. Of course we know how this ends, but short of the Russian misplay, it just seems to me like the material of the war is decided. Yeah. I mean, it seems, it seems predetermined because we know how it happened. But I honestly do think that they could have won the war. You know, they, they really could have won it. They could have won it with Burgundy and if the Asian hug box weren't a flop. Hello, Thogden. Yeah, let's, uh, let's keep going. Again, though, we all understood what happened here with this surprise attack in Lignitz, right? If me or Lizard stopped to think for a second there, we wouldn't have fallen for that, but... You know, if we had just stopped to think for a second, why would that province be left open? And why would there just be one random Indian 3k sitting in it? Could it possibly be that they've just done a transfer with the Ottomans and they've inherited a brigade that's now hiding 100k Ottoman stacks? 100k Ottoman brigades. So, there's basically a pause for no reason here, I don't know. And yeah, I'm probably telling Virtual Rock at that point to pull back because I'm hovering over him. Yeah, I know that I know that the YouTube chat might be more hostile to Twitch, but I'm very I'm very fine with the current format I have. I'm enjoying it. Well, Emperor Malgus raises a very interesting point in the super chat, which we can talk about. It's also funny to note how little money I've made in the time that I've just spent shadow funding. You can't really see it because of my name, can you? Can you see my money there? You can see I've made a grand total of 42k in this time. And there you go. So... Oh my god, Virtual Rock, you know... He... The enemy launch a couple of attacks there, and at one point in the VC he's like, Oh, it's going fine. The enemy's taking big casualties. I'm fine. Look at Lomza and Prezamisil, right? They're just open. He should have just put a stack in Lomza. He might have done a lot better. Were there any areas your side could have punched the fruit to connect you with the Russians? Good question, Emperor Malgus. Were there any areas of your side could have punched through to connect with the Russians? Um, the answer is no, uh, on land, right? Even though the front looks really narrow here between Poland and Moravia, like the entire bulk of the Ottoman armies there, the enemies are in the north, as narrow as the front is, and as, you know, this place is a lot of hilly terrain and forests, it's really not possible to break through. Um, and... I've talked about it before, I talked about it at the end of part 17 in the analysis section there, but Scandinavia could have transported troops, and I also do believe that if Russia had gone along the northern coast, hugged the northern coast, 
instead of pushing through Congress Poland, right there in Warsaw, he would have done better as well. Because Scandi could be able to reinforce him, and he has a you know a, an ocean, a, a sea protecting his flank, unlike nothing here. But really, to, to link up with Russia on land requires just wiping out the enemy entirely. There's no good place to push through. Like, the Russian army isn't even to the south of the front, so there's nothing in Romania, Hungary, like, there's nothing down here except Ottomans, so it's not good. Oh, and, yeah, Virtual Rock has already lost battles and is, pu is pulling back there, we can see. There's me having another little concerned moment looking at Burgundy. Yeah, v Virtual Rock's already encircled. Shadow funding is going off while I have 26k. Thank you Flying Scoots for the 1000 Huff, which is Hungarian Florins. Yeah, so when we see Virtual Rock getting heavily pressured, we obviously we have to launch an offensive, right? Uh, you know, we're not linked to each other, but we can at least put pressure on them to prevent them sending all their troops over to kill Virtual Rock. It's uh, probably it's too late to save his army, as we all know, but we have to. Uh, but our offensive here is going to inadvertently lead to better things, isn't it? So we'll see. How much does 1,000 Hungarian florins come to in pounds, though, again? Can we get some live currency trans trans uh, translation? Conversion. Would it be allowed to attack the corridor from the left, Russia joins the battle from the right and retreats to the left? If there is a position where that is possible, that would be allowed under the retreat behind lines rules. Yeah, you can retreat from one safe line but that couldn't happen because about 2.2 pounds cheers thank you um there's no position where that was possible really in in at this point thanks guys and thanks to the hungarian virtual rock was just larping world war one russia he really was wasn't he i thought hungary used the euro no they use huff so yeah, there was never any point. And if, if there ever was a position where the front was one enemy province deep, we already would have exploited it because, you know, you just attack that instantly. It's obvious. So there wasn't any position like that. There was, like I say, no chance of linking up the virtual rock here on land. But the Scandinavian position at the sea was never used in this war to link up with Russia anyway. It will be used for better purposes from the north. You will see it. Oh yeah, I mean this offensive, it's uh, but it gets very. Gr I, atta I accidentally attacked Gorlitz there, as we know we talked about it in the video, and then I decided to keep it going anyway because they don't look like they have much of a backline after what they've done to Russia. Nonetheless, let's skip ahead a bit because I know in about four minutes' time shit is about to hit the fan. Things are going to go from zero to a hundred here very soon. I know we've spent a lot of time just sitting here, you know, watching a few grinding battles happen, but shit's about to hit the fan. You know what's about to happen. The Albians have left Swinamunda open. Look. They've left it open. Why do people keep asking about Aragon so much in the chat? It's just an AI country. 
we saw a clear point in the series where the player decided to leave and went. And that was part 12? There we go, we're already starting to move around Sweden when the thing's about to go from 0 to 100. Uh, in terms of analysing this, it's very simple. Don't leave that province open, right? <laughs> simple. There's, there's not much else you can say. So thank you very much for the super chat, Rioza. Do you have any advice why one should look to learn the basics of MP? Uh, hopefully my videos help, but you have to just uh, join a campaign. Make, I, I list a ser I list loads of servers on my Discord in the Vic in the V2 MP Discord's channel. You can join a few servers, see if any are hosting a new campaign, see if they're friendly to new players, ask around, ask for help on my Discord as well. People will be happy to help you. Um, I'm, I always have it on the back of my mind to do more guide and tutorial content. I never get round to it, but I'm thinking of ways to do it. I'm thinking of, I don't know. I might put out a community post one day going, hey, have you got any questions for new players to Vic2? And I'll answer your questions on micro and Vic2 multiplayer and stuff. I'm thinking of ideas on how to do better guide content. But for now, let's leave that and get back onto the task at hand. Thanks for the super chat. In my technical guide to Victoria 2 multiplayer, there are some general help towards new players as well. In some of those middle sections, I think. There is stuff there. So, even now they could salvage it by attacking Swinemunde. And they could encircle it as well by attacking fucking Schwerin. But they still don't notice. They could also retreat out of the battles just before we hit them. And they would be safe. I mean, that's it. That's the encircle. It's it cannot be stressed how big this encirclement is, right? It's Berlin and Prenzlau, two provinces encircled. I don't. It's not possible for me to count how many brigades are actually lost in that because I don't have any saves near when it happens. Like I say, I have no saves in 1886. Yeah, Gaku has guides. I can't. Someone can link his full channel in the chat if they want. He's a good old Vic 2 player, multiplayer. Check his guide check his guides out. Slazer also has some, I do believe. You know, then the, the real dispute's about to happen when they retreat from Plenslau to Neuster, New, uh, Neusterlitz. Uh, I think the ruling that it was behind the lines is fair from one particular interpretation of the rules, although the behind lines rule often gets confused and mixed up and different interpretations are given by different hosts in different campaigns. It's a bit of a mess and I'm very, uh, I very openly acknowledge that, but it was fair within the, the rules here. I guess. Do you have any advice on how to not want to blow your brains out when sorting late game mold brigades? Like, I, it's very difficult. I get it. All I can say is wait for open Vic, and it's whenever it has a stuff like that, that nullifies that. For me, I don't like microing massive amounts of late game brigades in single player because I don't have a motivation but if I'm playing multiplayer then I'm pretty mo I'm pretty motivated to do it in multiplayer because you're it's going to be it's going to have great payoff payoffs in a player war so I never really have a problem with it but I, I don't like microing massive amounts of late game units in single player I would I wouldn't do it I usually end the campaign before it reaches that in my single player runs so the rule dispute begins here and I have uh, you know we'll just skip ahead a bit but I've got it no, 52. Yeah. When we unpause, they've deleted them. So that's the Battle of Pritz Walk that ended. They retreated. So they've got a lot of stack wipes. We just, it's hard. I just can't say how many brigades they lost, though. I'm not able to get that statistic. Uh, 
And of course we still have the one in Berlin also grinding down there. Well, I mean, we're also finding that pushing through further to Kustrian isn't working. We do need to, I mean, actually, I think I was surprised when they retreated that, to be honest. They did not need to. They were defending a forest. But the, the, the push to Kustrian is too far. We're, we're really running low on backline and, and uh, reinforcements here. So, yeah, sure, we, we did get a massive encirclement, but it was costly for us as well. That's the thing. It's not just, oh, we got a big encirclement, we win the war. These were all grinding long battles, even when they were encircled. And we lost a lot of men from it. And our attempts to follow up and attack further provinces did not break them. I guess the, the, whenever you get a big encirclement, you start to think, oh, can we can we use this to completely break them and win the war? But no, they kept holding. They'd already won the Eastern Front against Russia, so they managed to send some troops back from there and all that. And they held on. They held on. I mean, if we had just fully ended the war here, you know, we wouldn't have had to put up with the, the hell breaking loose. But again, in terms of constructive analysis, then it's, it was all about them leaving that province open and not responding to the impending encirclement. That's the only bit about, you know, what could they have done to do better in that situation. So yeah, we're, we're finding that our follow-up to Christian is too much and we're, my brigades are really depleted, so we pull back. Obviously, one of the big skills you need in Vic 2 multiplayer is to know when to retreat and when to call off your offensive if it's clearly not working, if you're losing too many troops. And look at the fat reinforcement ticks that the enemy just got, you know, in June. They almost could have launched a counter offensive against us, given how depleted we were after what we did. They can't see our backline though. They could only really assume that we have loads of shit everywhere. And there's the final stack wipe in Berlin, so that that was basically, you know, they encircled the whole Russian army, but we did massive damage to the Polish and Elbian armies. And whenever we kill Elbian stacks, they're not able to rebuild them. Russia, Russia already started rebuilding his army after he got wiped. And because of our offensive, they weren't able to go and occupy Russia, so he can rebuild a lot of his army with impunity, and he will contribute a little bit more again later in the war with army that he rebuilt although he will do so while out of sync remember you know that was that was hilarious wasn't it and again there's the Aragon AI sieging Bosnia they had a real grudge against the Bosnians for some reason and there is China announcing to join so, you know, they wiped the whole Russian army, but we just wiped a massive amount of them. And then China joins, and my reaction is just to laugh and go, what a joke. You heard that, like, three times. So this is where part 17 is ending, on the cliffhanger. I'm going to point out a very funny detail on how I did the cliffhanger, right? And there's India. Remember, India announces to join at the end of part 17, but he doesn't actually join that time. He joins later. I don't know why. I can't explain that. And at this point, 
I don't know. I mean, they, actually, they're they're starting to launch their big offensive now. This offensive by the enemy alliance, it's it's good in the sense that you know we've taken a beating. It's actually too late to capitalize on the how depleted we were after our offensive because we've had the July reinforcement tick. If they launched this offensive immediately after, then they would have done better, but. This offensive by the enemy is really stupid. It's really bad because they're getting burgundy. What am I doing there? And uh, they're getting burgundy and they're getting the Asian hunk box, but they're not there yet. They only joined the war in three months and their troops aren't even in position from the Asians. So how does it allow them to launch an offensive? This is a bad move by the enemy. They should have kept reinforcing and prepared to launch a big offensive to coincide with Burgundy joining the war. And, not only that, but when when Burgundy does join the war, they, they should have launched an offensive on every available province. Every province that they could possibly attack. They could have had a chance of absolutely just destroying us. But yeah, now it's the final countdown to when Burgundy and the Asian Hope Box join in, what, September, October, November, October, September-ish. Musantra is still in the war, but he will wipe peace out. He did nothing. He anticipated B uh, Batavia joining, and he hates Batavia. And I, I just, I still find that a bit boggling, mind-boggling, right? Why would Nusantra link himself on to a big European war to go against Batavia when he could just launch his own independent war if he wants that shit? We, I, we were not, I wouldn't stand for allowing him to have war score. Yeah, Big Weevil's going to come to our rescue. So here we go, Big Weevil announces to join the war. I pulled a sneaky on you at the end of part 17, right? By also including Ethiopia's intervention at the end of part 17. Big Weevil announces to join the war, Arcadia, before Ethiopia. But I edited it the other way round to increase the tension in the cliffhanger. There you go. That's pure cinema, isn't it? I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't leave you on Big Weevil announcing to join the war. That would have been too hopeful. You know, you know how the, the, the format works, right? The, the episode has to be left on our lowest point, and then the, the next episode builds us up, and how we overcome it. Pure cinema. Wait, 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 wait. Absolute cinema. Absolute cinema. The Martin Scorsese of Victoria 2 multiplayer shitty fucking stupid autism editing. To be honest, I thought you were going to lose with how many other nations going against you. Yeah. I wanted everyone to think we were going to lose because it looked like that. We thought we were going to lose. It's not, I'm not manipulating anything there. I thought we were going to lose. You know, everyone did. We all thought we would. Although, well, not, not completely. We didn't completely think we would lose. We were in despair, but you know, we were still hoping. And again, that was a really despairing moment there, right? Because I'm thinking of taking some of the troops from Gorlitz to reinforce the Burgundian border, only to find 150,000 Ottomans attacking it. Uh, but again, this offensive that they're doing on multiple provinces, four provinces, it's premature. It's too early. They could have done it like a month later to coincide properly with Burgundy joining. So the dual monarchy is retreating stacks away from battles, and I think he's taking a lot of them around to his own land to reinforce, which is sound. I mean, the distance to get to the dual monarchy is very long, so I don't know, but yeah. And he's new, and I don't know. 
So there's two more battles we have to deal with. How can we possibly come back from this? How can we have a chance? Well, in, in the context here, right, you can see I have, what? I'm counting. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Like, 10, 11, 12 stacks in my own land reinforcing throughout this time, right? So, even though we're really stretched on the front line, I'm reinforcing a lot at home. And out of all members of our alliance, I'm the one who has the best access to reinforcing land. So from that perspective, I'm the key role, the key part of this, you know, by reinforcing my men. And, you know, when Burgundy does swing round, it will be a large counter-offensive, mainly from my troops, but also some Arcadians from the south that will swing round and trap Burgundy's army and fuck him up. So it really comes down to that. Reinforcing the troops in my own land. And, and there's dual monarchy troops reinforcing in my land as well. And again, I'm always trying to send something to the Burgundian border, to even a token force. But here's the thing. Another bit of analysis to do is, yeah. You know, it, just like what Poland did at the start of the war against Russia, if you're... You know, if you're going to send a force to man a border, it either has to be enough to completely hold it, or don't bother at all. So, we were better off leaving the entire border with Burgundy open instead of hold, instead of trying to hold it with token forces, even though that's what people would do in real life. It's best to just leave nothing there and make them walk into you, make them start sieging you in unhostile land, and then plan your counterattack. So, I mean, what we did to Burgundy is a strategy that gets used a lot. And it's actually a strategy that Burgundy has used himself in this campaign. It's how he beat the dual monarchy one-on-one. -on -one. You pull back, draw the enemy into your land, and then hit them hard. That's what we did to Burgundy. And that's what Burgundy often does to dual monarchies. That's what they did in the Venice series uh, with me and Loco. A lot. That's the basic idea. Draw them into your land with a lot of troops backed up and then hit them hard when they're overextended and out of position. If you want to know why Burgundy lost this, that's basically the reason. It, it wasn't even intentional by us. We, we didn't hold the border because we couldn't. But that's still what, you know, won us this whole, this whole thing. But again, I'm mainly here not to talk about the diplomacy or players joining wars and stuff. I'm talking about the war and the micro mainly. Because uh, all the diplomacy and stuff is covered in the actual videos. It's just that I couldn't do much war analysis in part 18. Because I spent most of the part 18's analysis section talking about Diplo and peace deals. There's me calling the enemies retards. You know, you've got to do it now and again. But that's me specifically pointing out uh, substitutes taking over countries and not knowing what's going on and being easily manipulated, which is what's happening. Hey, I'm a new player substituting this country. What should I do? You should join our side in a war. Okay. But fucking hell though, remember when I said I had like 12 and 11 stacks sitting back in my country reinforcing? They've all reinforced and been committed to the battles again. And Burgundy is joining within a month. So, how, how, could, how do we win this? How do we win this? Even looking at it now, even after having seen part 18, at this point, it's hard to fucking see us winning, isn't it? Even if you know we do win. Has the potato been paid 1,000 total worth in Super Chats yet? Unfortunately not. Also, yes. 
here's another thing that happens, right? And this is crucial. This is absolutely crucial. So, and it's also another point as to why their big offensive was retarded. Sorry to use that word again if you're offended by it. I've just used it in chat. Now I'm using it again. Oh my god, but it's true. They got massively encircled by a Scandinavian naval landing in Pomerania. You can see it. That was... Like, that was one of the first things that happened in Part 18, right? It was huge. Because if we didn't pull that off, they might have still won. Like, doing that to them, it it threw the, the momentum out of their big offensive completely. It, it denied them so many troops that they could have used to gain the edge in the, the bit where the chaos breaks out. Um, and they just messed up by... Like, this uh, this particular sea tile is very hard to see when that's naval landing because it covers, like, fucking 15 provinces. But they should have just known that Scandinavia has transports. You know, we're in, a, we're in an encirclable, posi encirclable position from the sea. Just pull back from Swinemunda, you know? But I would say, it's probably fair to say that encirclement that happens just before Burgundy joins the war probably saved us. What were the rules around naval invasions in the game? I don't know, they don't have any rules. You can navally invade people. And there it is. And that, that encirclement was pretty quick as well, in terms of the battle ending after it happened. But they did not take long to lose that battle. They didn't even grind us down. So it's the end of October. It's October 29th that Arcadia and Burgundy can actually join. So again, another crucial factor as to why we managed to survive that was Arcadia joins at the same time as Burgundy, or at least in theory, because Scandi didn't have any Diplo points. So, Big Weevil, the, Amer the Arcadian cycle and all that, Arcadia, he came in clutch. Just right on the nick of time to help us deal with the Burgundian offensive. What are the naval capacity of each country? Well, that's something I haven't really shown because naval combat has not been relevant for me on the Nubians and there hasn't been really any naval competition in the campaign, so I just haven't really shown that. And there it is. We completely... Like, we beat the enemy offensive, the enemy's grand offensive, before Burgundy even joined the war. And that's what I mean. Didn't Weevil come in as a sub on a presumably dead nation? No, the Belgian Confederacy wasn't by any means dead when he uh, came to substitute at all. No. Uh, the Belgian Confederacy was still very strong and viable at the time. Uh, the original... He subbed the original Arcadia and became the power player. Yeah. The, the Belgian Confederacy had an original rostered player called Godog, uh, and in like session two, I think, he, he had to be substituted by Spambot, and then he came back again for another session, and then Weevil comes in by, in like session four, and then takes it over permanently. So again, you know, substitutes always have a big impact, although I don't think any particular because the Bel the Belgian diplomacy is you know has it is what it is throughout it's straightforward no none of the substitutes changed it or anything so it's just like, we held off an entire enemy offensive like almost within two weeks of Burgundy joining the war the offensive ended if that offensive is still going on in full force when Burgundy joins the war, we have no chance. We really don't. They launched it too soon, and it ended too soon, and they got encircled during it. 
That's why we won this situation. And China only is trickling small amounts of troops over. Barely has anything in yet. Well, I mean, maybe I'll tell you about the naval powers. And again, it's crazy, right? Burgundy's joining the war in days, and we're still, we're even launching offensives on them. Which we probably shouldn't have, to be honest. Although we, denying them reinforced decks here in, in the end of October is actually still... Still very good, actually. There's that panning view over China and the Terrania border. And again, I mentioned this at the end of uh, part 18 as my last point, but... Uh, you know, China lined up on the Terrania border with Russia, but Terrania doesn't join the war, so China can't move through until Terrania joins, or else he's going through neutral. That was a mistake. That was a, an inter-Asian hugbox communication failure, because Terrania should have been just announcing to join at the same time as China. And now Burgundy's in the war. This is Burgundy in the war now. And he's already coming through here. This is a very awkward encounter. Burgundy comes in with a stack here. Uh, and we don't engage it. And he just moves it out. He's, he's scouting us, basically. So, Burgundy starts to swing through. He also sends one stack to occupy Paris. We know what happens to that. That was a good joke. So he's starting to swing in. And we're, we're even launching offensives on them in the Eastern Front. That's how much their offensive on the Eastern Front has broken down and failed. Although, I mean, we really shouldn't have been launching a big offensive against them. Right? So Burgundy moves a couple provinces closer. I take troops off our back line against the enemies here from, you know, Saxony. And I start to try and position myself to hold them off with a new front line. But also, remember, we have an Arcadian stack here in Württemberg. And I have a lot more troops re reinforcing within, you know, safely in Bavaria, in my territory. And these, these people are going to take part in a wide, big offensive against Burgundy when he's overextended. So, what should Burgundy really do in this situation, right? Before him, he's got, an, you know, loads of enemy occupation. He's a long way from the actual front line in the east. Um, and I've thought about this. I don't actually really know what Burgundy should do in this situation. Because you think, oh my god, Burgundy's going to come in and just win the war for them. But it's really difficult for him. He's got to move through so much, you know, hostile territory. It's hard to imagine here. But just imagine this from Burgundy's vision. His point of view. All he can see around him are dark provinces with nothing in them. He can't see anything. He's going in completely blind until the Eastern Front battles. You can see them. So I guess what he could have done is probably move in less chaotically and randomly. Maybe moved in in a more orderly fashion with a sort of front line well defended on all those flanks so, we, so that we couldn't hit him the way we did. Maybe. Um, I don't know. It's very difficult. Very difficult to say what Burgundy should have done here. If Burgundy had just decided to try and deoccupy the war, it may have gone different. Yeah. Uh, again, yeah. So imagine if Burgundy just started moving very piecemeal and unoccupied the border provinces. That is. Uh, I mean, his allies were probably shouting at him to get in here, get in, move, Burgundy, move. If he just starts moving and start st starts deoccupying things on the border he's not really having a big impact burgundy's move here is to really just cause as much chaos as he can and dis disrupt and destroy our back lines and, and fuck us up but i mean he failed to do that and he also ended up just getting hit hard and overextended i don't know 
On occupying the Albion Confederation in the Rhineland and all that doesn't have much of an impact on the war. And another reason that Burgundy really doesn't have any viable front line is because he's completely exposed on the other flank as well. Because Spain is coming in and we, uh, there's a few Arcadian stacks within the dual monarchy. So he's completely exposed on that side. He doesn't have any future just sitting around the DM and occupying that. Do you occupy the Elbians to come back online? I just don't see the Elbians. Yeah. He, the Elbians getting enough land to occupy to start rebuilding brigades. I don't know if that really comes into play. Um. Hmm. Yeah, I think the more I think about it, the more I lean towards a slow occupation by Burgundy, even though that is probably just de generally discouraged by players. They don't like doing that. Because it's, you know, it's basic, it's what the AI does, it's what new players do. But in this situation, it might be best. At the very least, whenever we do come to hit the Burgundian army and launch a counter-attack against him, he's he's strong, he's got a front line, he can reinforce. Maybe he would also be better off just moving in in the northern half. You know, like this, in this region. But... Because that would allow him to come in stronger without the threat of overextending and being too spread out. Who knows Mario Grafter, 26, who knows. But let's see what actually happens. So, I mean, basically, he's moving in. He's moving in really unorganised and I'm trying to put up some, some kind of front. So is Scandinavia. We're trying to turn around and face him. Very cautiously. We don't want to start any battles yet. Crazy that we're sort of winning our offensive in the Eastern Front. It's moving as fast as he could to occupy this forest province is a pretty good idea on his part. Secure the best terrain provinces. It's a, it's a good move. And we even won this battle. We even fucking won this. Maybe they thought they were trying. Maybe they thought we were trying to do another naval encirclement in Kohlberg or something. But yeah, they they completely exhausted themselves with that eastern offensive. I haven't said this enough, you know. It was such a bad move. We can also see, and here's here's the who's in Paris moment. But Burgundy has basically already kind of stopped. You can sort of imagine a real history documentary, right? You know, they've run out of supplies. The German offensive has run out of supplies or something, you know? Their armoured spearheads have gone way too far ahead and they've stopped to let the infantry catch up. The Elbian pressure for an offensive may have doomed them. The Elbians really need to have any part of their economy back online. Yeah. Again, Emmett, I'm not really here to talk about naval limits or the diplomacy. I'm here to talk about the war. There I was almost accidentally attacking Burgundy in that forest, but instead I'm just moving around cautiously. It's a really interesting manoeuvre, a game of manoeuvring by both sides to try and gain a position. No battles have happened yet, but we've kind of consolidated a line against Burgundy. And this is where we're already kind of planning our attack on Lüneburg. Burgundy focusing down the single monarchy might have been a better strategy. No, and now the reason for that is that Spain is coming into the war. Is the VOD going to be up for this stream? It'll just be right here on YouTube as a public uh, stream archive on the main channel, right here. Yes. So, yeah, Spain is coming into the war and Arcadia is launching troops into the dual monarchy. So it's not good for him to move into the DM. He has no impact on the war. We have... You know, the only armies that are going to be in the DM are also people who are joining the war fresh. You know, Spain and Arcadia. It's not a good move. I mean, Burgundy obviously had the right general idea by doing what he did. He did, he really did, but... I guess... It was really just the build-up that had the biggest impact and how we held off an enemy offensive and did a naval landing encirclement on them. If anything, it was the Elbians 
PLC and Ottomans that let Burgundy down, rather than Burgundy letting them down by joining and failing. To be honest, I think that's a fair way of looking at it. Burgundy let down again what's new in this campaign. Yeah, um, Spain will eventually fully just siege down Burgundy and abandon his whole country with his army. So we've launched our first battle against Burgundy. Now the thing about this Battle of Lunenburg is that it initially goes well, but it ends up turning out to be a long grinding battle where we ultimately take more casualties. So, But I guess it did, uh, it occupied Burgundy. He started focusing on that battle and then I started coming in from the south. And it was my movement and some Arcadian troops here as well coming from the south. And you can already see Spain there by the way, in the, in the left. I don't think he's in the war yet, but he's there. We're already starting to hit these Burgundian armies and like fucking wipe him out in the south. So what should Burgundy do here? Well, if you look at Burgundy, look at him. He's, he's basically already fucked. He's already fucked right here in this situation. What does he do here? Possibly he makes a Hail Mary rush to the eastern lines because we're weak in Stendhal and Magdeburg and Bur Burgundian troops will get very close to the eastern line and fail to move to it. Yes, Schmuvel, yeah, he, he had less impact than it seems like he would in this situation. And in the end, he loses like 40, 50 brigades and then most of his army ends up just being reinforcements on the eastern front from that point on. The ones that survive. While his main country is fully sieged down, like the Albions, and he can't reinforce, and he gets war exhaustion, he dies. Yeah, it already looks like it's basically over for this Burgundian offensive. But yeah, he does try to move east, which is the right thing. Just try and break east as much as you can to link up with your allies. And the eastern guys, the Albions, they're, they're launching another offensive, rightly. But, like I said, they already should have... They should have made this the only offensive. You know, the one they've been really building up for when Burgundy joins. And yeah, it is the enemy eastern offensive that breaks through it. We, they, they win battles against us here. So it just goes to show everything I've been saying about that eastern front. And yeah, at this point, absolute chaos. Like, uh, you know, as we actually play this in real time, we're not thinking very much. We're just fucking running on instinct and trying to win battles here and there and reinforce the cycle. Just running on pure instinct, trying to communicate. Just absolute chaos. There's no time in a situation like this to stop and think of a strategy. You just have to. And that's that comes back to what I've previously talked about being focused and being in the zone because we've already been fighting for a whole hour plus three hosts we're in the zone we're prepared for this mentally whereas Burgundy might be really you know nervous not focused this part is total carnage yeah and yeah my music choice for this part of the video is obviously absolute cinema I don't remember what I, I I eventually do launch an attack into Kushtrin, but I don't remember what impact it ever had, or if those troops that I launched die. So what's the Burgundian situation right now? Still very bad for him, but it's that attack in Prenzlau about to wipe some Italians and win that, which I think you know it probably was a mistake by me, a big mistake by me to fail to reinforce that. Definitely, yeah definitely is which is why Italy says the province over again because he's pissed at me for failing and he's right props to Italy too small army bank up and still fighting on being a good asset yep yep a good ally to have for the whole campaign so far and he got rewarded well by getting the Suez let's be honest Burgundy isn't really in a position to act neutral they have to make moves to secure themselves. 
Oh, you're talking about staying out, right? Yeah. Now that's some. There's some diplomacy there that I'll talk about in the next episode, but this isn't focused on the diplomacy, so we'll save it for the actual series. So, yeah, the offensive down here is what absolutely fucks up Burgundy, and but he's also like we're we're about to break and friends out, and he's also really close. I mean, actually, he if he managed to get this 34k to attack Prince Walk 12k before Prenzlau ended, we would have been in a lot more trouble, but he hesitated or did, didn't reinforce that. And of course we lost Jetton, but that didn't get encircled at least yet. Then I finally realised uh, Prenzlau. And again, Burgundy's sitting here with this 34k. That's a failure on Burgundy's part. He could be uh, causing... I mean, he's already losing a lot, he's already getting hit hard, but he could still cause a lot of impact with this. He is winning up in Hamburg, though. That's really important. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's Burgundy's breakthrough right in the north of the front, around Hamburg, which ends up doing the most damage to us and causes us a lot of encirclements. But... It also then leads to what happens in Kiel later. So in this war, I guess, a big feature is that they launch an offensive, they do something good, they wipe all of Russia's army, but then we counter it harder with a better thing, like the, the landing encirclements and the counter encirclements and all that. And like I say, the Battle of Lüneburg went well initially, but we ended, it ended up being a difficult battle for us, and Burgundy's already doing better in it now. But yes, this is the continuation of just absolute chaos. Absolute fucking chaos. And we lose a lot of men up north now. We lose a lot of men. Scandinavia said half his army got wiped up here. Even though he does have transports, he probably doesn't have enough transports to carry all his men safely home. So he loses a lot. I lose a few stacks. We lost hardest up in the north because the, the eastern front broke through and Burgundy's offensive in Hamburg broke through. So we lost the most in the north, but we secured the south. And that's, that's what happened here. There's me finally launching my attack in Christian. I'm going to try, now that I'm watching the footage again, let's try and focus what actually happens to these guys I send into Christian. I, I can't remember. But yeah, we're getting, oh my god. Look how bad the north is for us. Scandi getting half his army wiped here. Me losing a couple of stacks here and here. And then Scandi here. Oh, it's horrible. You don't like to see it. I just got wiped in shredding. Just one stack, I think. In this situation, how do you even decide where lines and whatnot are for the rules? You just hope that no behind the lines rule dispute ever comes up in this situation. Because it'll be an absolute fucking mess to argue and GM. What are the soldier pops before and after the war? Well, figuring that out takes... Uh, we could do that at the end by going back through the, some of the saves. We could do that. That's actually... Yeah, I think it's possible because I've got a save right as the war starting and a save right at the end of the war. So we could get some good stats at the end. Oh, by the way, if you haven't already liked the stream, then please do. And if you're watching this while unsubscribed, then subscribe. And if you're watching this without actually having seen the Bavaria series, what are you doing? Go watch it. Links in the description. Um, and give a super chat if you're feeling generous today. Thank you. So... Even the Chinese stack is finally here. Even the Chinese stack is here. Finally. Well, I mean, what else has he been doing? It's only one stack so far. So yeah, this is us getting hit even harder in the north, but we're breaking through Burgundy in the south. Yeah, this is me pausing the game to change my party. That was a funny moment.
Alright. So the fate of the two stacks I sent into Kushchin was that they reinforced that battle, but I safely retreated them back to the forest. So they were fine. And to be honest, I think uh, that attack in Kushchin probably held them off a bit. It was a good distraction. It was a good distraction, because it's it's like a really... That, pro that province of Kushchin really cuts them off, right? Because at that point, it's just like a one province gap to actually get to the main front line where they're winning hard. You can see Scandinavia trying to retreat men to transports, but obviously he didn't send enough. And there we're even losing Cottbus. We're even losing that. Again, I've said this before, but uh, you go bankrupt in the game whenever your full interest payments every day exceed your total income. So I'm making 1.3k off of tariffs and 3,200 off of taxes. So 640 a day in uh, interest is nowhere near setting me to bankruptcy actually. Got to resubsidize the factories before they start closing. Yeah, the, the force of the southern offensive against Burgundy is huge. I have like four fully replenished stacks there following up on him. And then the front is kind of stable in the east. And then, of course, I rebuild all the troops I lost. They got battered. Spain actually joins the war and yeah there was a point here where I just told them to full siege Burgundy and then Weevil rightly said no go to the battles so in this situation Spain just should be sending as many troops as he can through into the battles onto the front line because you know what what use is it to siege down Burgundy here if we lose all these battles and die right we lose the war if that happens so it's important to win them first. And there's only a one province gap of hostile territory to walk through here and then come up through the El uh, through the Danubians and into the Albians to reinforce. So it's not as if he's rushing through to take massive attrition to get here if he goes this way. So, you know, at this point it still feels like chaos, but you can see we're doing very well with the exception of a couple more of our stacks getting wiped in that forest. Just those are the ones, the ones that were sort of latent, latent, you know, stack wipes. But other than that, the front line has now stabilised across a sort of diagonal axis after everything that happened. But we're generally winning all the battles. Even in the one where we're undermanned, we're doing... Loads of, we're doing good casualties, you can even see it there. So at this point, the front is stabilised. We took a lot of damage, but we've also done damage to them. We wiped loads of Burgundian stacks. Uh, this is the point where it evens out. Uh, now, you know, if the Asian Hugbox actually joined and properly reinforced, even from this point on, we would still lose, but they didn't. Imagine if China actually did send proper amounts of troops to this, or Terrania did join early and siege Russia and send troops and, you know. But then again, you know, we do have more Arcadians coming in every day than we have Spain, but, yeah. Yeah, maybe we wouldn't, if you really, if you do consider Spain an Arcadian, we probably wouldn't lose. So yeah, officially now the front is, you know, the, the, the absolute chaos has died down and it's become a stable front. Now, it's a stable front. And um, we won the Battle of Stade and then we push into Hamburg and obviously you know what's going to happen in Kiel soon. The diagonal access cutting along through the Kiel region there and that single Pomeranian pro uh, forest is really bad for them. My uh, my hindsight recommendation would have been for them to realise 
the terrain, the position they were in, the shape of the provinces, and how easily they could get encircled from the sea. So they should have pulled back from that as soon as they possibly could. That would be what they should have done there. Pull back from that terrible overextended naval encircled position as they could. Get out of there. And that requires them to just sort of stop and think, look back, look over, overview the situation and go, wait, we shouldn't be here. We can get easily cut off by Scandinavia. How is Russia's rebuild going at this point? I don't know. Um, let me see, see when the next save is. The next in-game rehost is going to be on the 20th of February, 1897. So in a few days. We can actually take a look at Russia in that save. Yeah. That's also the save I used to calculate how many brigades Burgundy lost. Also, I did a really a, a weird thing with my edit. So, you know during the absolute chaos how it gets to the Simpsons clip and then it stops? and there's a little ad slot and then it comes back and we're in a rehost and we're just chatting and planning and talking about stuff that rehost that we're talking in the middle of the absolute chaos is actually the 20th of february rehost and then i put the rest of it's i put it a little bit out of chronological order to make it fit what i thought about the video probably and it, basically it's just um it's absolute cinema okay take my word for it Uh, so we're about, yeah, Spain, Spain is crucial in uh, helping the Battle of Hamburg here, and which will lead. Okay, that was a, a rehost edit. We rehosted. Yeah, Spain is crucial in that Battle of Hamburg, which will lead to our encirclement soon. Right. Now, um, time to look at the game. Twentieth of February, eighteen eighty-seven, and we'll go on Russia. What has he got? His rebuild is going nicely. He's already got a full new stack. Oh, <laughs> he's killing Ottomans. He's, he's already killing Ottomans. Look. So, yeah, Poland has been sieged a lot. So they're, they're, they've sent some token Ottoman forces to try and unsiege Poland. Which is important because they want to prevent his war exhaustion increasing and they want to let him rebuild armies. And so far, the only provinces that Russia has sieged are by rebels, like in Jacobins in there and stuff, anarcho-liberals, that's it. The enemy hasn't moved into him. And that's because Terrania hasn't announced, well, he hasn't actually joined the war yet. And he joins in February, I think. In fact, he just joined now. So actually the February 20th save is actually when Terrania joins and China starts moving in. So you can see how late that was. He could have already been like three or four months into his occupation by now if he announced at the, the same time uh, China and Burgundy did. And he, oh, look at that. Look, here's Virtual Rocks rebuilding. Uh, is he stockpiling? He doesn't have money, but he should be stockpiling goods in order to rebuild instantly. Getting his army wiped has helped his economy. You know, he's making money. Yeah. Garaging soldiers in his most populous states, mostly. Good. Um, he demobilized, but he's not allowed to remobilize. So he's just staying demobilized. Makes sense. There's a sort of impact that being mobilized has. So if you've lost all of your mobilized troops and you're not allowed to remobilize, you might as well just demobilize. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, there's no point. He's on 17% war exhaustion, whereas Poland's on 34. The Albians must be on massive war exhaustion, 98. And you can see what's about to happen here in Kiel. Right, shall we continue with the footage? Let's go back. Anything else to look at in this save, do you think, anyone? Dragonese Brigade count got down to 118, minus 153, which is shockingly close. Dual Monarchy at 195, 
Spain is coming in. He's still mobilizing. Italy 2-2-1. Two, two, Poland 1-4-5. It's about to drop even more. Albion still has 1-6-2, which is a respectable amount, but it's been whittled down massively from... I mean, he used to have, like, over 300. My war exhaustion is 12. Ottoman 18 war exhaustion. From, I don't know, blockades, I guess. And his brigade count. Yeah, the Ottomans... Uh, the Ottoman Empire is the country in this war right now with the highest fucking surviving brigade count, if you don't count the Chinese. Scandi brigade count got down to 145. All these countries have very similar brigade counts at this point, like 140, 160-ish. Everyone is remarkably similar now, after battering each other. If you go to Scandinavia, he just lost a lot. Um, maybe he didn't lose that many, I don't know. I've got... how many brigades does he have? He used to have about 230 standing brigades, according to my note here, but... He must have also lost a lot of soldier pop then, because he can't rebuild any. And of course, he also has... All these stacks in Africa doing absolutely fucking nothing. And in West Africa as well. I told you about these at the end of part 17, I think. What, what, you know, what is he doing? Even the AI was trying to move them north, unlike the player. What does Arcadia have? Well, he's not mobilized, but he has 162 professionals and he ends up sending loads of them. You know, his, his transports are out here. He's, he's moving. Look at his transports go. Nice. They're, they're shipping troops back and forth all the time. Of course, by the end of the war, the Ottomans will finally start receiving some wipes and get his army, his brigade count down. Right. So, the next big thing that's going to happen is, of course, the Kiel Encirclement, and I've already explained why that happens and how the enemy could prevent it. Although, after a certain point, you know, when you see that amount of troops they have in Hamburg... Though, I mean... Those troops that are in Hamburg are mostly Burgundian, and it's, it's the PLC that mostly gets wiped, so... Some kind of switch happens before the Encirclement, I guess. It doesn't happen yet. Burgundy... Yeah, Burgundy just, look, Burgundy, uh, this is really good by Burgundy. He retreats, like, I don't know, five or six or seven depleted stacks there. And he's safely retreating them behind to reinforce safely behind the eastern front lines now. I guess, look at Nusantara, someone asked. Ugh, it's too late. No one cares about Nusantara anyway, the peace out of the war. Um... So Burgundy takes his depleted stuff, he's he's now just on the eastern front. He's switched he switched around while well, this country now gets sieged down. But he does well to maintain what's left of his army. And it ends up being Poland somehow coming through there to get encircled in Kiel. We'll see how that happens. How the fuck does half the Polish army end up there at, from this point? I don't actually see it. I don't know how this happens. Burgundy can't reinforce. He can, but slowly. He hasn't been sieged down much yet. So, for a, for a little while he'll still be able to reinforce. But it will wear off when he gets sieged. It's, yeah, you're right, but not yet. It's not occupied yet. Just But throughout the war, my troops are the ones that have the best position to reinforce on our side. So, you know, my boys are just the absolute the workhorse. Just cycling constantly back and forth, into the battles, die, out of the battles, reinforce. Right, that was the Scandinavian landing there. That's it. So, I guess it was just PLC troops in Hamburg that I couldn't really see. The encirclement has already happened. That's it. Those stacks are in Schwerin by Burgundy. 
They can still safely retreat, but everything past it is encircled. Unless they safely manage to retreat themselves into that battle. Burgundy can't reinforce because the land is occupied and talk about land which you retreated to. Oh yeah, in the short term, he would have to go and sit in allied territory to properly reinforce, yeah. He might yeah, I think he missed on the he missed out on the March reinforcement tick there. You're right. Even still though, look, we're doing so badly in the Battle of Hamburg. The remnants of the Polish army, as well as what Burgundy has there, are still holding off. But then Weevil lands more in Kiel. Yeah, he completes that encirclement and then he reinforces the battle. If while they're doing that, I'm still just focused on cycling and reinforcing the big ongoing battles in Anhalt and Brandenburg. That's my focus. So, somehow, yeah, that's what I'm really confused about, right? Because now it looks like there's about six or seven Polish stacks, but you couldn't really see them before. They were in Hamburg, then they retreat to Kiel, but it's hard to say where the fuck they came from. A Burgundian sack that was left in Hamburg probably just got wiped. I pause the game here, or we pause the game going, oh, he's behind the lines, but we decide instead to just wipe them. You know, no one cares anymore. And then... That's a Chinese stack there that just gets skill issued and dies, showing how careless the, the China player ends up being and how he just fucks up and he's starting to already embarrass himself and make himself less of a threat. Then I get my rebels. You can see Burgundy being sieged by the DM in Spain there. the uptime on this stream so far? How long have we been at it? Um, two and a half hours-ish? Yeah. It's flown by, hasn't it? I could analyse wars for years, you know, ages. Uh, time flies when you're analysing a war. Where is DM and his army? It's mostly sieging Burgundy at this point. And that is something though. Uh, the, the dual monarchy... What he's actually done, and it's a new player thing, he's consolidated his stacks into big stacks. So those stacks there, 36k, 36k, they're actually big. I can show you in the current save, which is, we're going back to February in the save. Um, well... At this stage, this is too early. It's before what he did, but here he is. Look, look at that. And I'm I'm laughing in a sort of like you know, at, in terms of you know an innocent new player, right? Because you know we would have all done this. It's it's cute to see a new player do it. He's put his whole army into one stack to sort of try and reinforce it under the legendary command of Lazar de Gaulle. But I guess after these have reinforced a bit, what he does is in half, split in half and start sending them back and also he occupies Burgundy with them. Some of the biggest battles were initiated by DM. Were they? Yeah, some big battles in Central Europe were, yeah. But now we fast forward and he's sending... So those stacks are 36k but they actually consist of like fucking 40 brigades or something each. This is us laughing at Poland. I, we were particularly laughing at the Poland player because of the aforementioned toxic voice chat stuff that we had with him. He called us a hug box and stuff, and you know, I kept out of the video. I thought I'd keep it more serious. But, you know, we're laughing at his army dying. And we're, we're there's more context to it than you can see in the videos because I don't show the bit where we argue, but it makes it all the more satisfying when we fucking destroy his army. And then that also explains why we laugh so much when he leaves to be replaced by the original Poland player. But it's all fun. It's, it's all... And then of course, you know, we're laughing. We're starting. I, I say he puts the L in Kiel. Did that message get shown in the video? Yeah. I think it's in there somewhere. I didn't dwell on it. 
And he's researching a psychology tech. Wait, what? See? Oh yeah. Oh, he, he doesn't have he doesn't have full mill tech yet, but yeah, he is. Oh yeah, this one. No, yeah, you said psychology tech, but no, the the research points one, which is good. Yeah, the res research points one is good. Yeah, but he has military industrial complex. Um, actually, now, because this goes back to the whole story of the dual monarchy's bad literacy with Captain Ben, the player. So, I, I think it probably would have been better to get the social thought tax, which he's been sorely lacking. But the research points is still fine. Because that will start making up for the loss of, you know, tech, how behind he is in literacy. 50% literacy is just terrible. 50%. Uh, Albion's 94. Burgundy, 93. Me, 85. New Santara, 81. Because that country is fucking buffed. Scandinavia, 77. To be honest, even Scandinavia is lagging a bit behind. And it's probably because of Ireland. In fact, Ireland starts at pretty low literacy at the best of times, but under this dual monarchy player, even lower. So that's probably why Scandi... Actually, you know, I'm doing a stupid experiment. Wait, wait, wait. Just to prove the point here. Um, just to prove the point. Just to prove the point. Okay, watch this. We're looking at Scandi's literacy. Release Ireland. How much literacy does Scandi have without Ireland? 91%! I, I knew it! Ireland is tanking Scandi's literacy by 20%. I knew it! I just proved the point. And then Ireland's own literacy is... 41. Behind the dual monarchy average of 50. Yeah. There you go. Anyway, 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 anyway. Back to this. We're starting to get towards the later phases, about halfway through part 18 or something like that. That's the keel stack wipe when Poland's army goes down to 67. And I showed how much they started the war with. They started with like 300 or 290. So proportionally, Poland's, Poland's army might have been one of the, the most damaged armies in the whole war. And then Burgundy rightly retreats from the bad offensive forest battle for them. Then they retreat from Berlin and th thinking about this overall, right? At this point, almost basically, we've now just gone back to the situation before Burgundy joined the war. Back to the status quo from a few months ago. That's what the absolute chaos did. And I think, yeah, the, the overall effect is we've gone back to where the borders were before Burgundy joined. And we now probably have a bigger brigade advantage because we've wiped Poland and the Albion so much and, you know, Burgundy. But we've also gotten Spain and Arcadia because of the Asian Hugbox joining. Well, the Asian Hugbox has only contributed like two shitty depleted Chinese stacks. So... You know, the enemy decided to put their faith in Burgundy joining and the Asian Hugbox joining, which triggered Arcadia and Spain to join. And, you know, look how it turned out for them. Again, I don't, I still maintain that I don't blame the Elbians for continuing the war. I understand it. But we can just see how it turned out in hindsight. Puppeting, puppeting nations might actually be meta. Yes, it often is, yeah. If you think about literacy and stuff. One of the biggest examples in Vic 2 of the trade-off of literacy is Japan and vanilla, whether you annex Korea. If you annex Korea, they'll take your literacy down as states. It's basically whether you want to take Korea uh, before you westernize. Because if you do, they'll become states, but if you take them later as colonies, they don't affect your literacy score overall. But you can't build industry in them. It's the age-old Japan conundrum. And it's to do with Korea. Um, but look at this, right? They've 
this is yeah encirclement that was just basically just another positioning fuck up they should have just the ottomans they got trapped in noisterlitz and like i say the ottomans has survived largely intact so far but at this point he finally starts to get encircled as well it, you know just bad positioning from them Glad to hear it, Pastorevich. And yes, uh, Mukanu. Yeah, actually, yes, Mukanu. Having the region so deep in Germany helping to reinforce. That did come in very, very important in this war. Although, that's not the reason I consciously took Saxony in the, pa in the previous peace deal. But it ended up being that way. It's not like I planned it to be like that. I just took Saxony because it had the best pops and shit for the war score it cost. But it ended up turning out to be crucial for winning future wars. This is where... Yeah, look, this is where things get a little bit weird. I crash here. Why do I crash? Because I open the general change menu as a stack is moving and then I actually try to assign the general after the battle has started and it's invalid because I desperately wanted to get rid of this two attack I put in you know quickly because the Ottomans attacked Gorlitz so I started moving to Lignitz to try and encircle them uh, and then after I crash the Ottomans will start moving to Haradets to will move around because Italy Italy breaks the line in order to join my attack so I don't get wiped or to do this encirclement. This becomes another little bit of chaos, which... And also... Oh, no, no, wait. It goes back even further because Italy attacked Kustrin. And then... Yeah, because the, the Ottomans is attacking this forest to counter, to encircle Kustrin. And then I attack Lignitz to counter-encircle that. And then they try to counter, counter... And then, you know, Weevil says counter, 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 counter-encircle. It becomes a crazy game of counter encircling each other and in the end we i think we came off worse because you know we got really losing a lot of the italian army there you know i wonder if i can use saves to see how many brigades italy lost um italy has 221 brigades in the february 20th save 1887 221 about that so well we could actually uh we could load up the save from when i crash and we can just count the amount of brigades in the the battle that italy's in because he, he ends up losing them so back to victoria 2 the game and we go to june yeah june 1887 go to Italy this time so compared to where we were where I crashed Italy sent his stack from all from Haraditz and probably Osig into Lignitz to reinforce this encirclement oh this is bad are they all oh, oh, minus one brigade so it's this is about eight stacks of 10 brigades each, so 80 brigades. Ooh, fucking hell. 80 brigades lost here by Italy. Not his old not his whole army, but that is again one of the big that's one of the bigger biggest encirclements as well, and the enemy got it. That's terrible. And uh Yeah. So how is a province cost calculated? Oh I don't know, it's complicated stuff. Now we go back. So have I, I, yeah, my editing of the thing, I'll just, yeah, we come back in. Um, when we rehost after I crash, someone gets stuck in the lobby and then we rehost again. But I edited that. This is us rehosting a second time coming in. Wait, no, no, wait, wait, wait. Yeah, you can actually see it now. So this is what I returned to, right? And Dempsey immediately unpaused the game. But, you know, he complains that I paused the game doing a micro pause although it's completely fair to me fair for me to pause the game because I had just crashed and I didn't know what was happening and he immediately unpaused it 
I think that's very fair to keep it fucking paused for a minute. You know. A couple other times in the war I did unashamed micro-pausing, but this time it was very legitimate. So, yeah, luckily for us, the Italian brigade from Brno arrives in Haraditz before that Ottoman one. And I actually went into the safe to check if Italy had a speed general on the stack, but it wasn't. So that didn't come into play. He just got there fast. So. Wait, let me just check if the Ottoman stack here... Uh, Does do the Ottoman stacks here have a minus speed general? No, no. Doesn't, doesn't count. Check Albion's money? Okay. Check, you should, you should be giving me a super chat to do this and check my money. He has a lot. So, see, the enemy alliance is still being funded massively by the Asian hog box at this point. Right? It doesn't even matter what the Albions has money-wise. Sure, the massive wealth that the Albions built up for the last 50 years did run out. He sent half of it to Italy and then lost the other half of it through the war. But now that they're being bankrolled by the Asian hogbox, it doesn't even matter. China has 2.77 million, and he's, he's only about to get machine guns. Uh, Bharata? He's, India's actually out of money. That's good. India's actually out of money. And his mail tech is shit. He doesn't even have breech loaded rifles. Um, Japan is completely irrelevant. I'm not even going to check them. So they've done a little bit more occupying of Russia now that they've been in the war, but they're not doing it very fast, are they? And they've, they haven't even unseized Poland. Wait, we have a special guest? Wait, who's this? Do you want to call the other side bad? Something like that. Hang on. What, what, are you, what are you doing in the stream? Are you just going through the video? I'm analysing the war with the whole footage, and we, we just actually got to the point where your 80 brigades got wiped in question. How do you feel? Live reaction? Oh, I might have to kill myself. I don't know. It's fucked up. Well, hang on. Is 80 brigades just like nothing, man? You have 80 out of. I remember, didn't we wipe like 200 Poland brigades, then like however many Albion brigades and however many Burgund? That feels like nothing at that point, at that point in the war. True, true. So quickly call the enemy bad. Oh, they're bad. But uh, also, I think I was going. I went completely bankrupt, so like my guys weren't even getting org. Which is, uh... Yeah, which true. is interesting. Just doing a debt economy. Yeah, it was fucked. The enemy side were being funded by the Asian hug box. I don't know. It's like it's just cascading poverty mod. Like in any other mod, I probably would have been making money at that point. It's like an eighty percent literacy Italy. Like, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't know the technicalities with the fucking world money supply, but it was fucked. It was fucked. Yeah. There's also like, like China will China always makes money unless you like, like take out all the IGOs and make and make it all fish. It's always gonna make money. So. Yeah. Well, I don't know. How's the analysis going? Is it? It's really interesting. It seems popular. Yeah, like I was I was looking at it earlier. Look, you had like 400 people watching. It's pretty good. Yeah. Well, loads of people. Are into the series, so it's natural that talking about a war in it will generate a lot of interest. Yeah, it's a pretty good series so far. You definitely edited it well. Thank uh, you. Yeah, because I remember playing these sessions. There was like so much rehost bullshit. I was like, I was like perpetually mad at the rehosting stuff. But yeah, I mean, there's like eight. There's like eight rehosts in this war. <laughs> Poland goes out of sync five times in a row. Does that make it harder to edit, or like? About the same. About the same. It's it doesn't really yeah. matter for editing. Yeah, I figured. Anyway, thank you for your live reaction. To <coughs> oh, eight brigades dying. Yeah, no problem. 
So yeah. Yeah. Also, wait, can I say something about what I would have done as Albion's? All right, one more. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I would have said, like, even looking at it at the time, if you want to call, like, a dozen people in and promise them all land. Like, because he gave away, um, he gave away Burgundian land, I think, I think Polish land as well, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, if you're going to do that, you just, you wait until next war. You don't let yourself get full occupied and then give away land. Like, you do it the other way around. You go in next war, you're like, okay, bros, you help me out here, I'll give you all your land. You don't, like, depopulate yourself and then give away land. Yeah, it's if just, he cut his yeah. losses earlier in this war and then built up to fight the next one and gave land, he would have done better. Yeah. Yeah, like, especially because, like, the Asians, it takes, like, at least a year for all the Asians to get their shit over, assuming they're playing competently. So, like, just banking on Asians joining mid war, it's like, it's like a no go zone. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. Well, have fun. Bye. See ya. That's some good live comment from one of the players. Maybe another one will show up. Who knows? Maybe we could maybe we could summon Chrono or Dread. They're still around, but yeah, that was a good point about. Um... But yeah, it's, it would be better to cut his losses when it's clear that they're sort of losing this war, but then come in later. But we'll see what happens later in the series. Who knows? So where were we? We're at this chaotic bit here, but we managed to salvage that little situation. Ultimately, we can't save the Italian brigades that have been lost here. But I mean, we we still have that encirclement in Neustrelitz and... Uh, yeah, Kustrian is the one that's encircling like two provinces, but we're going to lose it. So unfortunately, we didn't get many encirclements there. Poland goes oose again, as you can see. But this time, because Poland has been wiped so much, we don't have to rehost for him. He's happy to just continue because he doesn't have that big an army, so it doesn't matter. So, pro tip everyone if someone's oosing a lot, kill their army so you don't have to rehost for them. And they don't matter enough to be rehosted for. Look, so we we can see Virtual Rock's wild 30k running, sprinting from Königsberg to try and save the Italians in Kustrin, but it's too little, too late by the time they arrive. <laughs> Just imagine him sprinting all the way from Königsberg. I, I don't even think the enemy noticed the Russians coming. They don't even notice. But yeah, it's too late. We, uh... We follow up here. Do they retreat the ones in Prenzlau, or just... Wait, 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 hold on, hold on. Like, Kustrin and Prenzlau are connected. But we follow up to Kustrin, and they fail to retreat Prenzlau. So... And I don't remember, I don't think I've really dwelled on this very much in the video. But this is a massive fuck up by the Elbians to lose, like, I don't know. Significant remainder of his army in there. Like, I can see the battle a few days or a few weeks before. Oh, this happened. Uh, Elbians is on 155 brigades. He's about to lose eight stacks in this battle, although not all of them. They're of varying size, so it's harder to calculate how many stacks. It's like, if you take away these little three stacks, you know, if you take away the little three stacks, basically like, I don't know, 50 brigades, 40 brigades, anywhere in there. So he's losing like a third of what's remaining of his army, and this is entirely avoidable. There's no limit to retreating that. So what happens from this perspective is the Ottomans, like, they win Kustrian and wipe that Italian army. Then they pull out of Gorlitz. But then, then I try to follow up to Kustrian again 
to try and re-encircle Cottbus and Penzau. The Ottomans uh, retreat Cottbus to get away and live with his army, but the, the Albions fucks up and he stays in Penzau. That's just a, a terrible mistake. That's it. That's the analysis on that. Diagnosis skill issue, and I don't mean that in a mean way, that just is what that is. And, you know, again, the Albions is a rather inexperienced player as well, so... He's learning. Learning the hard way. But you can't also just put the blame on the individual inexperienced player. He's also got to be advised. His allies have got to be telling him to, uh, to retreat that as well. There is a lot. There is collective responsibility and an alliance to an extent. We're kind of responsible for helping the dual monarchy as a new player. And we help him well. We give him good advice. Although we don't really help him with managing like his big army stacks properly to split them and all that you, you shouldn't consolidate your entire army into one stack you should leave them separate as they are and let them reinforce up so but we can't really it's hard to tell them that because we don't really know because only he can really see it and we're focusing but we, we help him with individual micro you know and he really get he really gets the hang of that really quickly anyway let's continue shall we And um, the Ottoman troops managed to retreat from Cottbus, but uh, of course a Chinese stack auto retreats behind the line and dies. Interview, yeah, this is an old chat message because the chat's dead, but interview with the veterans of the Second Brothers War. I don't think this is a bro- these aren't- this, you can't even call these Brothers War anymore. These wars are becoming world wars every time. It's not just a brother's war. This is World War One. So yeah, we're just left with that attack in Lignitz, which is going really badly. So we should pull, yeah, we pull out of that. And of course, we're just wiping up, mopping up the stacks in Nurstrelitz and Penslau. I feel after the wars that we fought in part 14, 15, 17 and 18, I feel like I've looked at the names of these provinces around Brandenburg and Anhalt so many times now. How many times have I thought of or said the name Cottbus, Pritzwalk and Kustrian for the past few weeks? It's ridiculous. Fighting wars over the same land. And wiped and deleted. And then... Yeah, so at this point we're, we're trying to plan a naval attack into Kohlberg, the forest in Pomerania behind the Battle of Stettin there, but that won't work because they can they retreat that in time for it. So, I mean, this phase of the war, we're just going to gradually push them right back and back and back to the Polish border. You know, gradually. It just becomes... There's less encirclements from this point. It becomes a war of attrition. And we've damaged the Elbian army so much, the Polish army so much, even the Ottoman army so much, which doesn't have that many troops of them here now, and what few troops the Asian Hugbox has sent. So we're, we're able to absolutely just dominate a war of attrition here up to the Polish border. And the war is, you know, if it wasn't over for them before, it's so over for them now. And also you can see I'm rebuilding brigades behind my line here. So that's always good. Like, you know, we've still got half the Spanish army not committed yet. I'm rebuilding brigades. It's it's clearly over here. If it wasn't ever clearly over before, it's clearly over now for them. Let me get these funny clips with the outer sync Russian army. I think I think that was hilarious. When do the Ethiopians come in to save the day? There they are. I think I just saw one of their stacks around there somewhere I think it's in one of these battles you just can't see the flag if you didn't like what Ethiopia did just wait for part 19 I mean, you know, you know what happens in the war, right? But at this point, 
you know, I, I said, I mentioned to Lizard, you know, cut, they should have cut their losses. They can still cut their losses now, even surrendering now, rather than in December when they do. You know, because that's still, between now and December, still a lot of pops that they aren't growing, pops that are dying, time that they're not spending just rebuilding after this shit. It's been a theme of many of my videos before, but you you know, a lot of the time, and there's my, <laughs> there's my multi-province retreat, the one time. The one time, okay? And uh, the, the onus is on the enemy to point it out, or else it's fine, as Reno would say. Um, you know, sometimes you just have to cut your losses and build up, fully replenish, so you can win the next war. Hello, Giga Chad Gaming and Gladius. Any new super, ch super chatters joining the chat? This is the final offensive, right? Yeah. One long, gradual victorious offensive up towards the Polish border and even into Poland a little bit and even after India joins right because we're, we're not even afraid of India but that for the enemy alliance at this point you know it really is over why are they even continuing to fight I mean t at various points in the past you could argue they had a chance but now and there's Lazard the goal rolling a 9-1 to Burgundy there Absolute Giga Chad General. Here we are launching our next offensive down into Silesia because we can quite clearly see. Now, as for our vision behind the lines here, so it's not really down to India per se. Well, some of it is, right? We can see Breslau because we have troops in Kustrin in the battle. We can see Opel and Nemezio because of the Indian stack, though. And we also have Russian occupations in some of Poland. So we can clearly see behind all their lines now. But it's because there's a Russian occupation in, in here that's giving us a lot of vision and the Russian stack that's actually... Wait a minute, wait. Did that did the Russians actually just wipe Turanians and Tuchel there? Is that what we just No, they're not wiped yet. Do they get wiped? L look at Tuchel in the top. Does he actually do we actually wipe Turanians there? Didn't even notice this. They get wiped, right? That's what I'm looking at. Yeah. A fucking a Turanian stack just gets wiped and I didn't even notice that when I'm editing the actual video, like up in the top right. Fucking Turania just get... I'm still... It's like 50 years later we're still digging up the dead from this war. We're finding Turanian corpses under the ground 100 years later. Wow. In this case, two years later. What, do they have a behind the lines here? I've paused the game. What am I pausing it? Oh, this is the Breslau incident. Oh, that's funny. See the Breslau incident in the actual video? That's even a ed slightly edited down version from the actual shouting and seething and Spain arguing back. But yeah, that was my second micro pause of the war. The first one was the liberal victory in the election. Are the Russians finally back in the war? Not really that much. Like, and he's out of sync, remember. He's got like a couple of stacks in, in this province here. I wouldn't say he's meaningfully back in the war, especially because he's out of sync and can't really micro properly. But he is constantly rebuilding brigades and yeah. don't really understand why they left the Ottoman border empty. Which Ottoman border? With who? What do you do for work outside YouTube, Spud? Nothing! This is my job! Give a super chat today to support the channel. A lot of people think, still think my channel is too small to make a living off, but, you know, I've got the YouTube. I just did a sponsorship, like, a few weeks ago for something, and 
I've got my Patreon, I've got my Twitch, I've got streams, and I can have a comfortable living, it's all a good job. I don't need to flip burgers in McDonald's to make this, uh, make the dream come true. You know, it's all enough to survive on. Yeah, this part of the war is just so fun, funny. I mean, just they're fighting on for nothing, like, and they're just getting constant retreat behind the lines, constant fucking encirclements, dying as we gradually come towards the the Polish border, and we're like, India, we don't give a fuck. We'll kill them too. We'll push all the way in and kill them as well. And if the war continued even further than it did, we would have. Gilded Destiny. That's right. Check it out. If if we get another super chat, that's my current super chat alert because I had it on from the previous discussion stream where I talked about the sponsorship. And there's another couple of Chinese stacks behind the lines posing. It's just this bit of the war is just an absolute joke by the enemy alliance. India's in it now. Wow. Even after the Asians joined, they never utilized the extra front line from there. All right, so yeah, throughout a lot of the war, yeah, good point. The uh, the Danubian and Ottoman border really isn't even nothing even happens on it, even when we're at war. And the reason for that is that the Ottoman Empire just it's obviously a lot better to send his troops up into the actual front line with Poland and the Albians rather than holding an empty border against me. Uh, there's just no point having troops there for either of us. I mean, the border is basically around Slovakia, you can see at the bottom of the screen. Yeah, it's just, it's always better to send your troops to contribute to the ongoing battles and the main concentrations of forces rather than to hold front lines that don't really have an impact on the war. I think that stack there in Brandenburg, that 30k stack, is one that's just been entirely newly built by me. Like during the war. Great Hungarian Alps, Steiner's Indian Offensive will save Elbia. We're already pushing in a little bit to Poland now. You know, we're, we don't give a fuck, we're pushing in, although it is too far, and we do pull back. If the war continued, we would have gone on to just completely wipe out everything they had. They clearly have nothing much behind the lines, and we are still reinforcing and have a lot. It would have been even more, you know, if, we, if the war had actually continued. We were unstoppable by this point, and the, the Asian hug box had sent not nearly enough to contribute meaningfully. Because as Lizard was saying, you really just have to reinforce before the war starts. Call them in before, or get them to prepare, and get them to send their troops and man the borders up before the war starts, for them to have a meaningful impact. They did not turn the tide of the war mid-war. And there's even, well, the Elbians is trying to rebuild some little stacks there behind in the little land he has left. He's trying, he's trying, but it's too little too late. And we're coming into December, the Christmas miracle. The war's about to finally end. If someone did say in 1887 that it'll be over by Christmas, they would have been right. You know, earlier in 1887, when Burgundy joined the war, when Burgundy was in it, it was fair to say it'll be over by Christmas, because it was. And this is pretty much it. 
the war is about to end. Negotiations may have already started in the VC. There's going to be a rehost. There's going to be an oos and, you know. The last sort of things I want to do is, well, I'll take any questions and I'll, I'll take any super chats, but I want to look at soldier pop death stats and work some of them out. Because there's a save right as the war starts, so there's a save right at the peace deal, so we can get some really accurate soldier pop stats, and I maybe should have done it. Maybe should have done it for the actual video, but it's... I did say, you know, this, this entire stream is based on a comment I put at the end of the video, which is, you know, there's all sorts of stats I can get, but I just don't have the time, and the editing process is long, and the video is 54 minutes as it was. So, we can get them now. I think, yeah, look, this is it. The war is over. We're doing negotiations. The war's about to end. So let's head up back into the actual game and look at the saves. We made it through the whole thing. We made it through the whole footage. What did we learn from this war? Well, I'll let you all reflect on that. Let's start in the save of eight, April 1884. Go on to the Danubians. Um, how many soldier pops? Remember these numbers, okay? Remember these numbers. There are 376 0.03k Danubian soldiers. There are 471 uh, 471.83k Albion soldiers. Who else do we want? What was it? 17 million soldiers died? No. Uh, let's be new. Let's get the semantics right. Uh, there were 17 million casualties, which doesn't that doesn't equate to soldier pops dying. So a casualty in a battle doesn't equate to one soldier pop, because one soldier pop actually provides three thingies in a unit, and you have military hospitals that turn some casualties into non-soldier pop death. You know, there's a lot to it. So now, what other countries should we get for soldier pop stats? Poland. Poland has 434, so both Poland and the Elbians have more soldier pops than me going into this war. That's why I'm bloody scared and trying to get allies to support me and all that. 434.37k. I'm writing them down as well, though. <laughs> um, Burgundy, yeah. Interesting. 214. Because Burgundy's been battered a lot through the, through the years, more than anyone else. 214.07k. Ottomans. Yeah, we'll get um, Italy as well. Three two nine. Slightly less than me. Three. Italy. Three two nine. This, by the way. This is this what I'm doing right now is basically the sort of thing I do when making the videos. I I look at the save, I get stats like this and write them down physically on a note. This is actually part of my video editing process. You're getting behind the scenes access here. And this is this is like how I do it. I I, I load I load up a save and I take the stats. So the closer my saves are to the actual war, the more accurate they are. And this war has perfect ones. So uh Ottomans. I mean, we might as well just do everyone. 681, fucking hell, that's a lot. Okay. 681.12k. And Russia. 503, nice, a lot. 503.92k. Big European War. More death than actual people in the provinces they fought over. Yeah, yeah. Scandinavia. Eight oh three. Scandinavia has the most out of any country we've seen so far. 
Too bad he has most of them sitting in Africa. 150 fucking K in Africa. And another 84k here. None of them ever contribute to the war. I did point this out in the video though. I did point this out uh, in the analysis section of part 17. But his soldier pops are a lot. Fucking 803. That'll do, right? That's enough. Are there really any other countries? We do the dual monarchy, but eh, that's enough. Right. We fast forward to the save 22nd of December, which is basically the moment the war ended. This is like the surrender. So Danubians goes down to 271. I've, I've lost about 105k. I used to have 376k. Now I have 271k. 105k soldier pops lost in that war. Jesus Christ. Um, and then Elbians. Elbians is down to 200k. Oh, that is fucking massive. He's lost 270,000 soldier pops. Holy shit. 270,000 soldier pops lost. He's lost more than Burgundy's entire soldier pop count when the war started. When are you going to reveal your deep love for Vic 3? Um, soon. When they pay me 1.5 million dollars in five business days. Africa is just a soldier pop generator for Scandi at that point. Yeah, if he actually uses them though. If he actually uses them. So, next country is PLC on the list. PLC has, uh, he's lost about 190,000 soldier pots. He's gone from 434,000, 434,370k to 248,700. And uh, now we go down to Burgundy. Burgundy is 199. Burgundy has barely lost any soldier pots. He started the war at 214,000 and he's only gone down to 199,000. Why is that? Burgundy barely lost any soldier pops. Huh. Maybe... I don't know. Maybe his his armies just died mercifully quickly so he couldn't lose any more pops out of them dying in battles. I don't know. Maybe his encouragements really paid off through the war. I don't know. That's a weird one. He's not even funding his military spending up. And he's fully occupied. What the fuck? Yet, yeah, well said, uh, Remainder. Remember that all the the soldier pop losses we've seen are in spite of everyone encouraging soldiers and gaining new soldiers through the war. At the same time, it's offset a little bit. For Italy, we have... It's 297 now. He started the war with 329k. So he's lost about 30k soldier pops. He also hasn't had that big a loss. He joined late and probably has bigger military hospitals more effect. Well, everyone has like 20 mil tech mostly. Maybe Burgundy didn't reinforce, which means less soldier pops to die. Uh, Turkey? So Italy didn't lose that many either. Turkey has lost quite a lot. Turkey has lost quite a lot. Also, another thing to consider is... The different cultures? Nah. The Ottoman Empire has a very diverse culture range, which is different to... It's difficult to consolidate a soldier unit out of these different cultures, but... I don't know if that has an effect on these, these stats, so... The Ottomans started with 681,000, ended on 481,000. He's lost 200k. He's lost 200k, 200k soldier pops. Russia has uh, 443. Russia's only lost about 56k soldier pops. He started on 503,900, went down to 443k. Now, last but not least, Scandinavia. 
Scandinavia took massive losses in the war. 471. Oh my god. 471,000. He started with 803,000. So he's lost nearly... He's lost 300, 330k soldier pops. Which may be even more than the Albians. Wow. He's not even fucking encouraging soldiers as well. Maybe that's why. Maybe that's why his losses have been bigger. He's not encouraging soldiers at all. Maybe there's a factor. Northern Germany is the graveyard of nations in this game. Yeah, the, the, the area has been hallowed. What about the Asian hard blocks here? Slowly creeping up to you. I'm not analysing their stats. We know they have like 100 million pots and loads of brigades. And some of them... They, pro they probably didn't suffer... They, pro they probably gained soldier pops through the war. Because they didn't contribute. <laughs> uh, you know? It was just a normal day for them. Almost. But China did lose a lot of stats though, really. Thank you, Curious. So, I mean, that's it. We've I think that's a solid, long three-hour analysis of the War of Part 17 and 18 from the Bavaria series. That was really interesting, and it's a format that I might like to do again. Whenever there's another really interesting war to do another deep dive into, that would be great. Maybe, uh... Um, are there any previous wars anyone would be interested in seeing that I may still have the footage for? I still have a lot of the Venice series footage, I think. No, wait, I think I actually have deleted it now. I don't know. So... I already did it for the war in part 14 or 15, mostly. From the enemy POV. So that one's covered in the, in the Christmas stream in the link in the description. If you want more. And you haven't seen that. The stats are now written officially by Enema in the chat. To be they're noted down for the record. Arcadia, oh, you know, we know we know Arcadia has been gaining, right? He's been getting immigration the whole time, and he joined late. He's probably gained. I don't know. Ah, that was nice. That was very fun. That was decent. Good stuff. Any more super chats? Any more super chats? Island pop. Island pop check. For my island, well, the Danubian island has 215k people on it. So that's a good island. Thank you, Drew. I, I really enjoyed that. It's very different. It's good to... What a breakdown of the Aragon No Guy campaign. I don't think I have the footage for that, so I can't break much down. There is generally another format of just sort of looking back and overviewing series and stuff. Well then, Pat, you can just watch this stream from the beginning. You can scroll back or you can wait. When the stream's over, it will just be a full video, essentially, on my main channel right here. I'm not going to put it into the official Bavaria series playlist, though. I can't really do that. The playlist is for the videos. You want to watch them, you want to binge watch them, you don't want to watch a massive three hour technical war breakdown stream in the middle of it. Uh, I'll mention it in the intro of the next video, and people can come and watch it retroactively if they wish, of course. It'll be linked, but I cannot in good conscience put it in the, in the playlist. How much money Scandi has at the end of the war? This is the end of the war, they have this much money. Oh, you can't see it because of my name? They have 656k. When Scandi lost half his army, that was a great economic boon for his country. Glad to hear it, John Smooth. I think it's really good. It's uh... One thing that I did definitely have in mind is at least when the Bavaria series ends, to do a whole discussion stream about the Bavaria series, recapping, rounding up the whole series. Um, I definitely want to do that, but... Maybe in the rest of the series we can do another breakdown. Who's to say if there's another war like this, though? Uh, we'll see.
And by the way, something that a lot of people pointed out in the comments was, you know, El the Burgundy ended up ultimately gaining out of the war because he got transferred to Albion Palatinate. He didn't lose any regions and he gained the Palatinate, so that's a win overall for Burgundy, isn't it? He suffered a lot. He didn't lose that many soldier pops though at the end of the day, and look what he gained. So, good for Burgundy, really. It was fine. Diplomacy discussion would be good too. Yeah, it would be, but at the end of the day, unless I bring on other players from the campaign, which is a distinct possibility, actually. Maybe I will, but if it's just me, all I can give you is my point of view. I try to be objective, but it's, all, it's from stuff I know. Every other player has their own POV. So it's that's why I don't really... I do analyse the Diplo from that perspective in the videos a lot, but, uh, you know, I don't think I'd do a whole stream like that. Burgundy walks again. Yep, yep. Um, thank you, El Emperor Malgus, very much for the $10 super chat. Very funny how both the Elbians and Ottomans lost land to both sides of the world. Wonder if that will happen again in the series. We'll see. And, so yeah, I mean, at the end of the war, during the war, India got two, these two regions in the transfer from the Ottomans. And then after the war, they also got these two. Ottoman Mazandaran and Erika Jemi. And these are all states, by the way. They're not even colonies. These are, these are states. Yes, Anima, yeah. We could have mock court for the rule arguments too. Nah. You can't recreate the rule arguments in the game. You have to be there. They're a special thing. The rule argument in part 17 was great, wasn't it? Fucking that that alert was weird, because this is like a similar song to what's in the alert. Thank you so much, Emperor Marcus. So as for part 19. I said this at the start of the stream, but in terms of what's next, um, part 17 and 18 were massive. <laughs> Took a lot out of me to work on them. I worked my ass off on them, but for part 19, I'm taking it a little bit more easy, but it will probably still be out two weeks after the last episode, a week on Saturday or Friday. It still will be there, but... And then the next one might take longer, I don't know. Okay, just bear that in mind, everyone. And... Uh, you know, part 19 is already really fun to edit. I've done some funny things with it already, because it's, you know, it's a post-war episode. You know, so... It's one of those episodes that's after a war, and we're starting to build up the next war, basically. But it's also got a lot of funny things. So, is there really anything more to say here? I think we've wrapped it up and covered everything I want to cover. It was a great stream. I want to thank you all so much for the support in the super chats and all the great questions, engagement in the chat. And of course, I want to thank every player who was in the Bavaria series for... Oh, my, my music just ended. Are we good? Hello? My background music just stopped. It's over. We're in silence. So yeah, just uh, you know, thanking everyone involved in the, the campaign that led to the Bavaria series as well. You know, people hosting it, people made the mod, Dempsey, Bota, respectively. And there's going to be a lot of funny things happening in the next episode when I think about it. It'll be great. Hopefully you have a laugh at that. And yeah, check out my Twitch. I'll be streaming Raft with Pychocker hopefully tomorrow, which is a big change. A very good comfy change of pace from the Victoria stuff. If you're interested. So I, I stream my gaming streams on Twitch. And my discussions here. So thank you so much everyone. Have a great rest of your week and weekend. There won't be a new video tomorrow or Saturday I'm afraid. Because you know. It takes a lot longer to make these. Thank you so much chat. It was a great stream. Too bad there's no music to see us out. Bye everyone. My end screen is just, it's just black darkness because I do not have my, uh, I don't have my outro images on my new PC. So just enjoy the darkness and the silence. Bye everyone.